You know the drill. Please smash that subscribe button, hit that like button, and enjoy the show. You, you're looking at somebody who thinks that you're going to kill them, and it's like, I just want to get off of this mountain, and it's also like the whole, the whole... Did you want to kill him? No. 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 That never quite, like, in, because it would have been defense. Like, yep. in that moment, you're thinking, this guy has a knife, I don't, if I got a free shot to, like, pound his head mm. right into the sand and he dies, hey, I live. No. I never thought that. The thing that snapped me out of it was seeing his eyes and seeing seeing his face covered in my blood. Like, that was horrifying. How long did it take for you to realize it was your blood and not his? Well, I saw, because I, I was on top of him, so I saw it leaking out of oh. my head. And... I just want to start off this podcast by saying thank you. Thank you to all of you who have been rocking with this show from the beginning, to all of you who have joined along the way, and to all the people who might be clicking the show for the first time right now. I mean, it blows my mind that a kid can start a podcast in his parents' house, and people on the internet will give it even 30 or 60 seconds just to see if we got something. And that's how we developed every fan along the way. So to all you people who have done that along the way, you are making this thing go. And I'm eternally, eternally grateful for that. And if I don't say that enough, I'm sorry. I need to say that more. But it's very cool to see where we're at. And it's very cool to think about where we're going. And that's what I want to talk with you guys about. In case you haven't noticed, I am very, very bad at self-promotion. Like, historically bad. Now, you see me put that video on the front of these episodes that says, like, subscribe to the channel and like the video. That's fine. You're supposed to do that. But that's about all I do. I don't really tell you guys about my other platforms. I don't tell you guys about the things we got to do to be able to get it into the algorithm on YouTube. And you guys are busy. I need to tell you that stuff that people got to be reminded. I know I do. So the only thing, despite all that, that we're not doing great on recently is the subscribe button. Everything else looks great. You guys are clicking the videos. You guys are doing insane watch time on the videos. And I mean, people have been sharing on social media. Everything looks awesome. But on YouTube, the most important thing is the subscribe button. And when we don't get that hit, episodes are not put into the algorithm, plain and simple. So I'm losing some money right now. That is on me. I would like to be able to make money so that I can hire people full time. We can scale this thing and get you guys more content and better and better guests coming in. So if you could help me out with that, I'd really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who has already subscribed along the way. You guys are awesome. That said, please enjoy this episode. You're not a plant, are you? Huh? You're not a plant, right? A plant for what? Like a plant for like an agency or something. <laughs> no. I don't have to like kill you in the back. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> It'd be so much cooler if I was, man. I would love to be a plant. It would be very cool if you were a plant, but it wouldn't be cool for me because then I'd be I'd be accused of putting a plant on this show. And yeah. The internet comments don't like that very much. I'd assume that you've probably been accused of that before, haven't you? We, though? Dude, we all get <laughs> accused of it. I always joke with people. I'm like, well, we're all technically useful idiots because like you don't know every person that's coming in here. You don't know their motives. You gotta I, do your best. You know? I mean, look, I don't think that the uh, the CIA is uh, uh, doing a whole initiative where they make people produce independently produced books uh, in order to uh, uh, to infiltrate the podcasting ecosystem. Mm. But hey, if they want to do that, I'm free. Sound sounds like a little projecting right there. I That's don't right. Know. Seems like a great idea. I'm reading right into it. Be right super now. cool if somebody paid me to do that or <laughs> bought my book. You are not here. Travels through countries that don't exist. Definitely not made by the CIA, dude. Well, either way, CIA or not, I gotta say, man, you are living one interesting life. Thanks, I, man. Danny Jones called me before you even got in there, like before you even recorded. And he's like, dude, you gotta check out this. Eric guy and you got to have him in and then his podcast with you was great I had a chance to listen to some of that this morning but you know what what made you want to just start traveling to all these countries and not just traveling to these places but like getting ingrained into the culture to the point that you're like the man Friday around there yeah right yeah well I mean I think part of it is uh uh you know I'm a writer so I wanted to be as useful of a of a writer as possible. Yeah, you are not here. It travels through countries that don't exist. There's the book. Uh, this is my first my first piece of nonfiction. Um, you know, before that, I wrote theater. I wrote screenplays. A um, couple of bi- uh, books of nonfiction, or pardon me, of fiction. And I was a Peace Corps volunteer at the time, and I was like, you know. I can probably be a bit more useful 
with the writing that I do. You know, you only have one life to live and you only have a certain amount of skills that you're born with. Uh, and fortunately, I've always had a proclivity to uh, to read and to write. And mm. I was like, well, I'm pretty good at this point after two and a half years of, of living in a northern Albanian village uh, <laughs> at, at being really uncomfortable for long periods of time. Uh, and I'm also pretty good at uh, making connections outside of my own culture. And I also think that Upon coming back to the United States, I was just noticing there's a lot of there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of paranoia of the other as soon as you get back. Mm, you know, yeah. people are but I, I think in a certain way we we worship fear a little bit in the United States mm -hmm. because we have this sort of pioneer culture. It's like you do it yourself and and you know take take all of the benefits of whatever you accomplish, but also suffer all of the the detriments of what you accomplish. And you know, when you're when you're abroad and the world isn't like that, everything seems uh, antagonistic to people in the United States. And and I wanted to bring stories back that were were fascinating or funny or or interesting uh, that that shows that the world isn't just uh, you know constant warfare or or antagonism towards towards people who who we you know know and love. Uh, that p people are a lot more like us than we all give mm -hmm. each other credit for. Is it strange when you come back here? Yeah, every single time. And how long have you been gone, like, full-time-ish? About almost a decade. Wow. Yeah. I, I did I did two years pretty, pretty solidly back in the States. Uh, so I came back from Peace Corps... And then I started. Uh, I started actually working in in special education. So I was I was working as a like a, a special ed teacher for for kids with autism for about two two and a half years, um, and that was cool. It was really interesting work, um, and I think super helpful for this kind of work because it's like you have to learn how to be really patient. You have to yes. learn how to uh, communicate in different ways, and you also have to like learn how to. Um, uh, how to how to make contact with with somebody who's communicating in a different way than than you're used to communicating, um, and so I realized at a certain point, you know, I was making money, but uh, that wasn't going to be my path, right? I I still wanted to be uh, a writer that that was useful for for the world and in, in whatever way I could influence it, and I was like, well, I want to go and and be a international journalist because I'm curious about these things. I have no compunction buying a plane ticket and uh, going to a place where I don't understand and asking really dumb questions until I can put a sentence together about that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then sharing that with people back home uh, because I think, I think more often than not, like, we're, we're afraid to ask really dumb questions, but I, I feel very comfortable asking dumb questions um, and, uh, and uh, hopefully eventually you know, understanding a little bit more about the area that I'm in. Well, it's actually great to hear that because I even find myself, sometimes you can run the tape and you'll hear it on this podcast where I'm like, dumb question. And maybe, maybe once in a while it actually is. But, you know, I try to avoid saying that as much as I can. I probably don't do a good enough job because in reality, when, when you think about it, it's like that's the whole basis of the world is asking questions to get further and further down the line to get more what? To get more information, which is knowledge. And I had been talking on, on a recent podcast with somebody about you know, one of the, the many things that the great Carl Sagan said. But one of the ones that really struck me was when he talked about how something, quote, something terrible has happened between kindergarten and maybe it was like 12th grade or college in this country because he said when you look at kids when they're young and they're six to five six years old they ask you what is the sky what is the moon what are the stars why did the why did the plants breathe you know why are, or why are they alive like these basic questions that in society we may judge as like part of that oh what a dumb f question who are you when in reality oh my God, this is exactly what we should be wondering about. This is the imagination. And then by the time they get to the end of high school, they're like, oh, I don't want to ask that. So something has happened. Maybe, it, like, I can't speak for our world as much. You know, I talk to a lot of people around the world through this show, but I don't live in these places, right? You could know this better than me, but at least in this country, something's happened where people are afraid to 
really actually get inquisitive on something because they think they're going to be viewed as not smart. Yeah, well, and also it, they might be viewed as as insensitive, insensitive right? Mm. And I, I think that yeah. that's that's hugely problematic, right? I was um, I was in a cab uh, with some friends. And um, uh, the the driver I, I thought was Pakistani um, because he was playing this Pakistani song that I thought was 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 cool, um, and I was like, oh, it's that song. Um, and I asked him where he was from, and we were chatting for a bit, and and uh, my friends were like mortified. They're like, well, you can't ask somebody like where they're from because that implies that they're, <laughs> and it's like. No, you can, and and then you know. So we had this, we had this, this whole conversation. Me and that guy, and he was like, "Well, you know, I, I come over to this country for uh, for a couple months, and what I do is I I buy a new Tesla every time I come back here, and then I bring it back to where I'm from, and then I sell it on the secondary market. So like, I'm only here driving Uber for you know a couple of months, and then I I bring a Tesla home, and like I have like a Tesla dealership there, and I was like, so not only is uh, uh, like was that man not offended uh but he was probably the richest person in that car like, <laughs> and it's like if you don't if you don't risk asking a dumb question you never get to to connect beyond somebody else's like cultural frame of reference right it's like one of my favorite dumb questions is um uh you know like what's a song everybody from this culture knows Right. There's like some uh, uh, in when I was in uh, northern Iraq, the uh, the Kurdish part, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. Ooh, we're going to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I was I was there for like four months, I think. And uh, I noticed there's this one song that was playing every morning uh, and, and it was on like all the buses and it was it was in stores and it was in the school that I was teaching in. And I asked my Iraqi buddy, I was like, who's this artist? He's like, oh, that's Faye Ruse. Like, she's the, she's this Lebanese artist. And, and like, she's revered in, in a lot of the Levantine Arabic cultures. Um, but we only listen to her in the morning. I'm like, why, why do you only listen in the morning? He's like, I don't know. There's, it's just morning music. So now it's like <laughs> you, if you can connect just for like one brief moment and be like, yeah, oh, you're from Lebanon, that, that Feirouz, right? It's like suddenly you've made somebody from a totally different background from you understand that you're you're curious and you're open and you're you're willing to understand their point of view just because you know a damn song and people tend to fall all over themselves to share their background or their story or their their family or their culture with you if you even try to meet them halfway but i think that oftentimes because of our culture in the u.s uh people are are reticent to to reach out and to uh, uh, to try and ask these questions for fear of of being offensive to them, for fear of making them feel like the other. Yeah, the 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 offensive angle is the thing that I feel like we've just kind of lost the plot on. Yeah, because what we're doing in in this country, it feels like, and that's why I'm so curious, like exactly how they view it in all these different countries around the world. I've heard some things, but you would know, I'm sure, a lot of different countries and, and what their attitudes are towards, like, the state of what they hear coming out of America these days. But, you know, people assume the worst intentions at all times in America now. Now, I could point to places around the world that are dangerous where that is quite literally a part of the fabric, not from a political standpoint or a communication standpoint, but from a safety standpoint, right? Because maybe it's a war-torn country, things like that. You got to be very paranoid of everyone around you. So that's relatable. But in like a peacetime place like this, right? We have people so at each other's throats from behind a keyboard very often where they are just assuming that because someone says something one way, that must mean that they think this and therefore that they're that person that doesn't agree with whatever my worldview is left or right. To me, that that has happened fairly quickly. And I, I think the most obvious point here is that it's probably a phenomenon that's simply just been quickly exposed since social media came out and here we are you know effectively 16 years after facebook where you know this ship has left the f port yeah it feels like the temperature has it rises on that every single time i come home but what, what you're what you're talking about is um you know people assuming 
malice, right? There's a great, uh, I think it's called Hanlon's Razor. Hanlon's Razor is like, you know, it's like of of, of the great razors, um, Occam, you know, big shout out to Occam. Uh, but Hanlon's Razor is something along the lines of um, attribute not to malice what can easily be explained by ignorance. Yes. Right? And people will say, oh, you've spent time in the Middle East. Like, don't they hate us over there? And it's like, that's such a, a miss understanding and such a uh like it's a um it's a poor way of treating uh another group of human beings that have agency that are you know deeply intelligent deeply thoughtful uh politically understanding human beings and also most people especially people in the middle east are so good at understanding that that human beings are not their governments right of mm. all the people in the world, they're the best at understanding this. And so when I come back to the States, there is this constant feeling of uh, people probing to say, well, what team are you on? And then hoping that you're on my team. Yes. And and I, I think that that's, um, yeah, it's a, an emergent property of maybe the last five, ten years. I mean, then again, I, I don't know. I... I've uh, I haven't been back in the states for for Trump, all that time. Trump changed, Trump changed the temperature. I think. Yeah. Well, like when I'm looking at this phenomenon, 2015. That's when that kind of started. It feels like I could be wrong, but that's just the temperature I've gotten. Well, and this is this is something that I I think is is, is something that's so hard to put the brakes on, right? Mm. Which is you have one. You know, some somebody has a, a deeply, un, uh, you know, uh, a deeply arrived at opinion, or maybe one that that they can't really even explain to you. But whatever, if you have that opinion or you express that opinion in the states anyway, it, it seems that you have this sort of de facto understanding that they now have this whole raft of other opinions. It's like, yes. well, you're you're more conservative. Well hear all the things that I know about you when it's like, you know, that's, that's probably not the case. Uh, there's, it would be insane if any person believed and, and agreed 100% with any politician, that would be insane. And it would also be, uh, I mean, uh, creepy. Right? A lie. Yeah. What it would be. It's right? not even possible. Yeah. It's not possible to agree with someone on all of, you know, how many things are political? Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so, if you can't criticize or, or steel man your own your own position, um, or steel man the position of of somebody else, then then how much of of what you think uh, do you actually believe, or do you just believe it because it feels good, or because it's an interesting story? I mean, the there's this phenomena too of of like. Uh, conspiracy theories which have really just like the exploded in the United yes. States and I love them like they're awesome <laughs> they're so cool like they're so fun um but you have to check with yourself like is this story just like do I like it because it's really fun um like like yeah are interdimensional aliens coming and 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 eating babies so they can stay young forever and <laughs> and are, did did they teach us how to mine gold so that the planet nibiru could once again flow freely through the I, I, yes like, yes they did yeah I, i'm saying it officially <laughs> yes that is my stance um no like like that rules as a story <laughs> how yeah. cool but like the one of the things i say in the book is that you know, countries are stories, and mm. like a story, it is powerful, but you don't have to believe all of it. There are some parts of it you can believe into the damn marrow of your bones, and some parts of it that you can say are abject hogwash, and you have to investigate constantly what you actually believe within the context of that story. You know, we're all born between invisible borders that have an incredible story, almost like a spell cast over that land, right? I don't think that everybody believes 100% of that story, but it is um, important to know exactly where you diverge from what your national story is. 
because otherwise you can be controlled by it. Mm. Does your underwear get uncomfortable, too tight, riding up your groin, or even your well, I have the solution for you. The sponsor of today's show, Sheath Underwear. Sheath makes the most comfortable boxer briefs on the market. In fact, I'm wearing a pair of my sheath underwear right as we speak. It's my favorite boxer brief I've ever worn. Go get yourself one pair, just one pair, and I promise you it's going to change your life. In addition to their insane comfort, Sheath's stretchy fabric is made out of a moisture wicking technology, which means that sweat doesn't absorb into the fabric and give you swamp we all know what that feels like. Instead, it moves to the outer layers and dries. The bottom line is your underwear will stay cool, super soft, and comfortable at all times. So what are you waiting for? Go hit that sheath link in my description, use promo code Julian, and get 20% off the best pair of briefs you'll ever wear. Once again, that's promo code Julian, J-U-L-I-A-N, to get 20% off your favorite new underwear today. You know, I mean, there's so many abstractions that that can easily lead us down a road which which leads to very bad places. I mean, it can also ad, abstractions can also lead to very good places too. But it's like, as an American, one of the we're we're sort of sold this brand of like freedom, right? And it's like, yeah, yes, I I absolutely want freedom. Cool. Who controls the abstraction of freedom? Well, freedom means that we have to invade Iraq. Wait, wait, hold on a second. I want <laughs> no. You wanted freedom. You wanted freedom. So now we're gonna roll tanks into Iraq. Yeah. How did how did we get from here to there? Like that's that's the that's how consent is generated, and so the the sort of classical definition of of making a country, right? It's it's how to it's the art of generating consent amongst the governed. And the art of generating consent amongst the governed, right? That's dark. Yeah, depending on how you do it, because there's different ways to do it, right? So a really quick way to do it is to put a gun to somebody's head. Real quick, um, but that is a pretty br uh, putting a gun to somebody's head is a very brittle way of creating and running a government because what you're saying is this is the language that I'm going to speak to my population with, and this is the language that can be spoken to me, right? Mm -hmm. So if you are a violent dictatorship, well, then violence is probably how you're going to reach your end. So it becomes brittle. The idea of democracy is that if you have considered buy-in from the individuals that are governed by your country, they will say, well, you know, I am some part of this. I put my two cents into making this system happen, and therefore, why would I go and wreck it? You know, I, because if I'm wrecking the system, I'm also saying that, like, my choices were bad. And so that's why democracy is a more robust system than, uh, let's say, you know, a, a violent dictatorship. Uh, at least that is the theory. Uh, whether or not that is absolutely working in the world right now, I don't know. Um, financially, militarily, um, uh, even philosophically for a lot of the world, uh, some of the most powerful countries are not democracies. Yes. So we're we're in the constant conversation of history, and we always will be. Like I I was um, I was living in a place called Erbil, which is the capital of Iraqi Kurdistan, and also to to like uh, I I didn't have any money to to fund this book, so I just had to get jobs everywhere that I was. What uh, kinds of things did you do? Oh man, I was uh, so I the way I got out of the United States was I just googled jobs in Iraqi Kurdistan. <laughs> Dude, two weeks later, I was a third grade teacher in Iraqi Kurdistan. Fuck out of here. Yeah, dude. Third and fourth Did grade. Did you speak any Kurdish? Or... No. <laughs> no, I don't speak any. What the any... fuck were you doing with them? Uh, it, it, it was an English language international school. Um, oh, that works. And so, yeah, I, I they got me out there so fast. I was like, I mean, literally sent the application in. Three weeks later, I have an apartment in Erbil. Um, now, now my, it's that this, easy. Yeah. I mean, this was in 2017. Um, you know, I had a background in teaching, I had a background in special ed. Um, but this is also in, in 2017. So this, this was coming up on the Kurdish referendum on independence. So they were trying to vote themselves free of the Republic of Iraq, um, at this time. And then meanwhile, the Islamic state was on its back heels, um, so they were still, uh, there was still conflict in, 
yeah, this was 2017. Anyway, there's still uh, conflict in Mosul. Uh, they weren't fully withdrawn at this point. So, like, the Islamic State was 45 minutes away from Erbil. Uh, oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, like, uh, you'd meet, you know, there's uh, wonderful bars where it's just, like, there's just a bunch of shady people there. And you're like, why are you here? And it's like, I work for an NGO. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure you do. Um, <laughs> granted, I'm one of those people. So, like, like you know, I'm like. You see Andy Bustamante in there? I didn't notice him, no. Okay. Um, mm. You know, because, like, I'll be, I'll be like, yeah, I'm a third grade teacher. And then, you know. Uh, well, actually, people mostly thought that I was indeed a third grade teacher. Um, keep talking. I'm just going to fix that yeah, camera. Sure, sure. Keep going. So, um, you know, I was talking uh, uh, at a bar one night with um, some security contractors. They're English security contractors, and and you know they were they were working in Mosul. And I was like, uh, you know, what do you guys do every day? And the one was defusing bombs. Uh, that were left behind by the Islamic State, and the other one was uh, oh. he was an Overwatch sniper, as far as I know. And I was I, I asked him, you know, how do you, uh, where do you live? And he's like, oh, same building as you. And I'm like, oh, um, so do you just like commute to Mosul every day? And he was like, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, like we carpool. <laughs> like so, you you carpool in to Mosul every day defuse bombs for like eight hours or whatever and then you come back here and that's why you're at this bar right now and they're like yeah that's that's about it that's that's our day-to-day -day. um Different world bro yeah i mean so this may be one of the reasons why it was it was really easy to get a job uh as a as a teacher out there yeah i'm gonna put a video in the corner of the screen by the way just yeah. for people to get an idea of what they were going to this is from vice but it's behind you on the screen oh, okay, right cool. there right now oh yeah this is a drone of Mosul, and this is actually probably around, yeah, this is like 2020. Yep. So this is where they were going every day. I used yep. this at the beginning of the intro with episode 117 with Ryan Tate because he was in this whole area and everything. But yeah, I mean, th th this is just, this is. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's an interesting area too to, to, be, to be writing about it, but not to be an on the ground war correspondent and to be working in the area but not to be an NGO worker um, because you know my goal with with this book was that I was sick of writing about how the world was tearing itself apart and I was really astounded that the world can actually come together in new ways like it is kind of inspiring in spite of the chaos that comes from it, it is kind of inspiring when millions of people just decide to self-determine and they are like, we're gonna draw a line on a map collectively. And that's that's a super human story because we all live between these lines and maps. Yes. They were all drawn at one point. You know, I did my Peace Corps service in um, Northern Albania near Kosovo, which is also in the book. Uh, do you care if you take the small decor and detour and just explain how you got into the Peace Corps? And oh, what yeah. that was? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just want to have that context for sure. People. Um, so, uh, yeah, the way I got into the Peace Corps was I just sent in a really long application. But uh, what made you want to do that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, there's no, there's no like, uh, uh, obstacle course. <laughs> 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 like, you have to hug seven people of different cultures <laughs> and stop a argument between two people speaking a different language um <laughs> but did you always want to do something like that like just go help people and travel like that way or or what what made you like wake up and say i'm gonna oh man this? i so i i think that um uh I think that there there are definitely the there are the peace corps volunteers who who have you know, pretty, pretty strong impressions about, uh, well, I'm, I'm off to make the world a better place. Um, I, I knew what I was capable of and, and I was like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to solve world peace, uh, by, by teaching English in a, a small Albanian village. Um, but a lot of it was, was based off of this idea that, that I wanted I wanted new ideas to write about. I wanted a new perspective to write about. And mm -hmm. it also checked a lot of boxes that I just thought were neat. Like I, I wanted to 
live abroad uh, for an extended period of time that was uncomfortable. I wanted to um, learn another language and just have a different perspective. I think that a lot of, and I, I say it in the book, um, a lot of the writing that I've done um, and a lot of the, my sort of intellectual DNA is is from being a, a fairly anxious and, and terrified person, right? Um, you have all the makings of someone recruited by the CIA, bro. <laughs> Love to travel, join the Peace Corps, know, which right? they get a few people from they there, not keep, everyone. The, like, it's if you, not everyone. If you want to, like, forward my LinkedIn or something? That'd it's, be sick, dude. It's very low, but, like, you're an, you're anxious, you're curious about other yeah. cultures, well, I get, you're a wild card, you're smart as fuck. <laughs> Look, I mean, the, the way that I feel about about like uh, uh, fear and anxiety, though, like in in the context of this kind of thing, is like I get frustrated with being afraid of something for uh, an extended period of time. You know, we we both uh, I don't know how old you how old you are, um, but but I'm guessing that that we both were maybe teenagers during 9/11. And no, I was a lot younger. You were a, a, yeah, a lot younger. Yeah. Okay, all right. I was a I was a, a young teenager during nine eleven. And I remember it very well, though. Yeah, I well, every single you thing lived out here. Um, oh, you lived here? No, no, you lived here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that was that was the fear that was all pervasive for many years in the United States. It was like it was like the other the the uh, you know it was terrorism. It was yes. It was uh, uh, you know uh, Muslims and it was uh, radicalism. Um, I would buy into a good deal of this fear and anxiety, but at a certain point, I'm like this. If you learn as much as you possibly can about something. You can't be afraid of of it. Either you'll realize that it isn't something to worry about, or you'll fall in love with it a little bit. And so, the rest or you'll of, fall in love with it a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if the more you learn about about any culture, no matter how antagonistic to you that that culture is, you're gonna find something that really speaks to you about yes. that, or okay. some idea. You know, you'll find something that 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 you can. Um, that you can take on board. Um, and I, I feel like in my early life, the outside world, outside of, you know, Southern California was this really, really frightening place. And I was frustrated with that. And I was like, well, the, the best way to expose myself to, to the outside world is to, you know, take a, a leap into the deep end and be like, now I live in... Uh, a developing country, well, in a developing part of a of a developing country, outside of my native language, and I'm here for two and a half years. Mm. And you know, I mean, I always, I, <laughs> I'm like, look, if I ever become afraid of vegetables, I'm becoming a farmer. Like this is because <laughs> I'm just I'm annoyed by by being being afraid of things that that do not require my my fear. Um, and so, yeah, Peace Corps checked all of those boxes for me and um, seemed like I'd get a lot of cool bar stories. Also, I was a theater major, so I really couldn't do anything. You were a theater major. Yeah. Like, outside of doing... God, your life has gone a whole different direction, man. <laughs> I run into my theater friends every once in a while. I, I, I just saw them here in New York and... Like, what and... the fuck happened to you, Eric? No, I know. Yeah, that's that's usually the conversation. Um, <laughs> it's like... Uh, I mean, it didn't didn't really work out in acting, so I, I became a I became a, a, a travel writer. Um, I just thought, like you know, it, 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 but it, it doves it dovetails really nicely because acting training is all about like you know be as uncomfortable as possible. Yes. You know, it's it's not comfortable to be on stage in front of people, and it's also like you know learn how to fail but stay on your feet. And in any multicultural interaction, especially if you're you know, I was a teacher in in uh, in a small village, like, and it's like, hey, get up in front of forty teenagers and speak in uh, their language and try and teach them English. Like, good luck. Yeah, do that eight hours a day, and and it's like, okay, well, this is the hardest performance I've ever given. I've always kind of thought that the world, and I don't want to make the world like. I want to make it fake or something like that. That's not my intention in saying this, but you had said a little bit ago about, 
the concept of like why people wear certain things and it says something about them to signal to other people. You know, we dress up for Halloween once a year in America if you celebrate and everything. But every day you do dress up. There's a reason you wore that today and there's a reason I wore this. Yeah. Right? Even if I like didn't I li- put a lot of thought in it or you didn't put a lot of thought in it. I live out of a backpack and this is the cleanest shirt I have. Well, there's still a behavior that <laughs> yeah. happens there where you're like, at some point you bought that. Yeah. Or you got that and you said, I could see myself wearing that. It's a costume, right? When when you are when so point being like I've always thought when you're out in the world, when we talk about like acting and like the art of it or whatever, in a lot of ways, even if we are being ourselves, we are all acting in some way every day at all times. Even like when I just met you in the car today, right? I never met you before. Yep. Right. We've talked on the phone, Mm. but like the first few minutes, I'm not thinking about it, but you know, I'm getting a feel for who you are. So there's certain things I'm doing with my tone. There's certain ways, questions I'm asking you, you know, this is... That is that is a part of getting information is kind of I don't want to say I don't want to make this sound bad but like putting on the smallest fronts with people because they're not in your head. Yeah. Do you, do you think that's a that you know perhaps your background in actually studying how that happens being an actor like doing what you do now you're kind of putting all that technically to work constantly. Yeah. I I I mean in a non fake way. No. I mean I I think it saved my life a couple of times. I mean, really, genuinely. Mm. Um, I, I, I think that uh, a good portion of it, too, is um, a good portion of, of like, uh, acting training is, is understanding how to listen to other people really, really deeply. Mm. Um, and that's not just in the words they say, but their behavior, right? Um, so I think when you, like, when I, when I go to the places that I go, um, you have a split second to look at somebody in the eyes and say, well, is this person who's offering me a ride genuinely like a good person who's going to, uh, you know, help me out with getting from point A to point B? Or are we going to have a potentially violent and dangerous situation? Yeah. Um, and you have to read those vibes really quickly. You have to read that behavior almost immediately. And... Um, you know, I've I've had really great success in in trusting the right people, and and every once in a while, I've had some some really dangerous moments not trusting the right people. But I think that that understanding human behavior by uh, uh, by rep- replicating it in an honest way, like an actor, it was uh, absolutely the most valuable skill that I could have had. Also, it, memory is great because you know it's like you memorize a lot of words, and that's helpful mm. with with learning yeah. languages and stuff. What was what was the time where you had a really close call? Oh man, um, yeah, I actually I don't I don't think I've I've mentioned this publicly before ever, but it's in it's the last um, last chapter of this book. Um, uh, it's the afterword of this book. Uh, I I was in South Africa and I got attacked. Um, a guy hit me with a knife across the head here. Holy shit! Yeah, um, it was. I mean, wait, like slashed you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's there's some news uh, news stories about it. So if you Google my name, you'll see some pretty bombastic headlines about okay. about the whole thing. Keep going. Um, yeah. So I, um, I mean, this was, and it also has everything to do with with why this book exists now. What do you see? Yeah, American sur- survives Signal Hill knife attack ends up helping crying assailant. I did not put I yeah. You goddamn Pope you. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I'm putting those peace course. You tell the story. I don't uh, want to read this. You tell uh, it, the story. It's not I don't think it's written very well. Um uh yeah, I mean really putting those peace course skills to work. Uh, <laughs> somebody starts weeping, I was just like, please don't start any wars. <laughs> I'm like, I'm special operations peace corps. Like they only <laughs> They only send me in when things are getting uh, a little bit tense. Uh, I'm the last option before the military comes in. What's your in. agent number? Uh, like, are you 008? Yeah, it's it's. Well, I can't ah, really dis- I can't disclose that. Um, mm. But uh, but back at back at Peace Corps headquarters, I'm kind of a legend. Um, <laughs> Langley, you almost <laughs> got me. Almost, almost yes. got me. Almost got me. <laughs> but anyway, what uh, happened with this? So, guy? Um, so yeah, I, I mean, uh, this book, I uh, I got fairly close to uh, to you know having having cool publishing deal. And we're working on a documentary series too, 
and it was it was going great guns and we're we're getting towards the, pulling the trigger on on basically all of those things and then covid happened and and publishers were like oh nobody wants to travel mm. and then um uh you know the documentary series people were like well we can't film this cuz of covid Ugh, and then sucks. it just kind of fell off and i was like god you know i this this book was it, not only was it a really traumatic year to to go through so i i spent you know it was five unrecognized nations iraqi kurdistan kosovo Transnistria, Liberland, and Somaliland, um, and uh, yeah, I mean there there are some close calls that that are in the book as well, and so it's like I almost died to like make this thing, and like nobody wants it, and then I was sort of unable to write for about two years. I mean, I was making you know I was, I was making money working, um, uh, doing doing creative stuff for a, a blockchain company, um, and that was fine. But there was this, you know, this this problem that like I had lost my ability to write creatively because this book just never made it out. And so I was trying to do all of these things to kickstart my process again and to to basically be a writer again. Um, and part of that, like part of that journey, I was like, OK, I'm going to go uh, to a Vipassana meditation sitting. Uh, if you ever heard of Vipassana, no. oh, it's crazy. It's um, I mean, it's cool. Um, and I'd always wanted to do it, but it's so it's an eleven day meditation um, uh, uh, sitting. So you meditate for ten hours and forty five minutes a day. Uh, you can't read, you can't write, you can't, you can't do anything but meditate. Um, and uh, and yeah, so. Start started meditating um, and worked my way up to to doing that, and I was like, maybe concentration is my problem because uh, you know everybody's concentration is is not so great nowadays because because we have you know phones and and whatnot. Um, so maybe maybe concentration is why I'm not able to write anymore, uh, and also just general, you know, it's meditation is good for your brain. So like I went, again, you know, d- dove into the deep end as hard as I could. I was like, I'm not only I'm not gonna like start meditating. I'm gonna meditate the hardest <laughs> ever. I'm gonna be the best at meditation, quickest to reach enlightenment ever. <laughs> More Buddha than Buddha. <laughs> so, so I did that, and and uh, the only place that was it was open at the time because the world was kind of coming open again was South Africa. And I was like, cool, I'm going to go South Africa and, and meditate my balls off uh, until I can write again. <laughs> uh, I wrote that in my journal, exactly. Uh, and then, you know, I came out of that and I was like, okay, yeah, I this helped a little bit. I can start moving forward a little bit on this. It's not, you know, I'm not clicking along the way I used to because it had been like, three years, uh, two years of, of just not being able to even look at this piece. Um, and then uh, my time in South Africa was coming to a close. I was hiking along and, and this book had kind of gotten to the point where I was like, fuck it, I'm just not going to do it. Maybe I'll write something else in the future. And it's like 95% done. Like it was almost like to oh. the end. And I was just like, fuck it. Like, and it's just too hard. It's too scary. It's too whatever. I'm I'm like I'm not gonna put it out myself because like honestly, publishers didn't give a shit. Uh, uh, documentary crews didn't give a shit. So like why why would anybody actually give a shit about this? Um, and then I was attacked. So how does that happen? So I was um, I was hiking along um, in a, a place called Table Mountain near near a place called the the Noon Gun. So. I'll stick that Google map in the corner of the screen. Yeah. And hiking in South Africa is actually quite dangerous. Like it is, it's no joke. There is. They got like a lot of bears. (laughs) No, uh, no, they got a lot of people who want your shit. (laughs) Oh. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a lot That's of bad, a lot of individuals out there who who you could have a, a, a disagreement with about who should own your things. Hmm. Um, in my case, I felt like I should hang on to my stuff. <laughs> and this guy, he disagreed. He made a compelling point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so does he approach you with the knife out? No. So what happened was. Um, and and I should say, you know, for for once, I, I should also say that Cape Town's a wonderful place. South Africa's an incredible place. Uh, I would go back in a heartbeat. Um, you know, violence can happen anywhere, but um, uh, there are sort of well trafficked hiking trails that that you can go on on your own, uh, on your own if if there are quite a few people around. 
Um, and it's like daytime and stuff like that. And then there are ones that you probably should always like be with a group or whatever. Mm. And I was warned about this. Um, but the one that I was going on was, was fairly well trafficked, you know, people were on their own. And, and so I, um, uh, spent most of the day just sort of working my way through that trail. I was having just like a a really quiet and you know totally harmless afternoon. Like I was like listening to a podcast podcast about like mycology and and uh, like hiking along and you know uh, what mycology uh, growing growing mushrooms. Um, oh right! Shout out to the Myco Wizards podcast. Yeah. I love that podcast. What's that guy's name who goes on Rogan with the, with the funny hat? Stamets. Yeah, Paul yeah, Stamets. Yeah. That guy's great. Yeah, super cool. Yeah. Um. So I was like hiking along, and and it's just a gorgeous day. So uh, and I I hit a neighborhood on the other end of it, and I was like, well, I don't want to go in a neighborhood. I was enjoying my my hike. So turn back around. Bad decision. Really bad decision. Uh, because I didn't realize somebody had been watching me while I was while I was going up. Mm. And there was this tree that had sort of been downed in some respect. Um, and I noticed that there were personal effects there. You know, maybe a, a homeless person was, was living under it, but like, you know, didn't bother me. I just went around it. Um, and so I was making my way back towards that tree and I kind of ducked under it. And then on the other side of it was this guy and he had, uh, you know, it was, it was still we we're coming out of covid um, South Africa had just gone into some kind of new lockdown thing. So he had a mask on, um, he had his hat pulled really low and he asked me, and again, this is kind of like the, uh, the sort of vibe, uh, that, that is really clear, especially when you, when you've done some acting training, um, like where you just know something feels wrong. Mm. Um, and he, he asked me if I was alone. And immediately I knew it was real. Yeah. This wasn't a good situation. Um, and so I was like, no, my friends are are up there. And uh, at this point, I just felt him get us cl- uh, like a lot closer. And I sort of pulled him into me because I was like, if he's going to hit me, like I, I oh, want shit, him. Oh, shit, that's smart. Yeah. So like I, a good spy. Good yeah, for you. Good right? training. Uh, yeah. I was, uh, I was, uh, I was doing, uh, doing some martial arts classes in South <laughs> Africa while I was there. Shout out to Mad Fit Jim in Cape Town. You guys saved my life. Um, so uh, I pulled him in. But at the same time, I just remember seeing this sort of like flash of metal. And then I felt like this <laughs> clunk right on the top of my head. And it, it, honestly, it just it literally felt like somebody hitting you pretty hard with a stick. Um, and then I time gets funny here. Um, I don't remember exactly what happened next, but I do remember my brain sort of catching up with my body because I remember hearing myself like just screaming bloody murder. And I was like, wait a second, that's me. And then my brain was sort of back in my body. And I'm just yelling, fuck, as I'm like running down this mountain. Um, He's I mean, chasing after you. Well, I didn't know that he was at that point. Um, but I, uh, you know, it's just like the time sort of turns to absolute taffy. Um, and uh, you, you feel as if you're going too fast and too slow all at the same time. Um, and there are houses in the distance. So maybe 100 meters away, I can see a residential neighborhood. And so I'm like, if I can just get to that residential neighborhood and make enough noise, maybe they can even hear me now. So I'm just screaming my head off. And I've been told by locals that if you make enough noise, sometimes like a mugger will just like leave you alone. Um and then my foot caught something, and then I went down. And since it's a, a foothill of a mountain, it's an incline, so I start rolling. And Son of a bitch, that's not good. It's so bad. It, it was like, it's like you, if you ever had like one of those horrible nightmares, and then you wake up from it, and you're just like so relieved that it was a nightmare. It was like I, I felt like I was just about to wake up at any second, but then I had to keep reminding myself, like, no, this is this is a real thing that's actually happening right now. And so I, uh, I r- rolled my way down, um, but also, like, if, if you've ever heard of, uh, of yard sailing when you're skiing. No, yard, not a skier. It's such a, it's such a great term because it's, like, to yard sail is where you just, like, throw your shit everywhere because, like, you fell down. So it's, like, <laughs> it's, like, you're, it's like a yard sale. Yeah. So I yard sailed. So, like, 
not only did like I had like a metal flask on me and I had a, a decent sized, you know, water bottle and like a Swiss Army knife and stuff like that, like in the pockets of my backpack is that backpack. Um, but my glasses flew off, too. So how bad are your eyes? So bad. Yeah. So very bad. Um, Got to get you some contact. I, well, yeah, I know. Now I do. Um, and I was even making a decision about whether or not I should wear contacts that day. Um, and I clearly should have. So anyway, I went down. I'm laying there, you know, kind of like a upturned turtle. Uh, and I look back and I'm like, God, I hope he's just like he ran away after after this whole thing. And then he's like doing the Michael Myers run. And I was like, he's literally. And there, I've had a lot of close calls before. Some far too close. There's a couple of, of close calls that are, that are in this book and when I'm in, in uh, uh, Somaliland. But nothing, nothing this bad. And when I'm in a situation like that, my brain is just trying to think of all the different decisions that I can make that will help me at least get to relative safety. Yes. But this one, I was like, I'm blind. I stabbed. I, I, I didn't know I was bleeding at this point. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was, that was frightening. Um, I just thought he hit me with something. I didn't realize that it was a knife. Um, and so I look up and he's coming at me with a knife and I, you know, had two very distinct thoughts at this point. I was like, well, one, I'm so ashamed, um, that, you know, my, my family is going to hear about me after sort of tempting fate all of these years in these different places. My family is going to find out that I got stabbed to death on this mountain in South Africa and I'm going to be so far from home and, and I'm absolutely ashamed that I, I saddled them with this. Ashamed. Yeah. Like that, that I was so foolish to, to continue to tempt fate like this. So in this moment of massive adrenaline going through your body. Yeah. Fear of death. You're thinking about the shame uh, for your family. Thinking about my family, yeah. For going for a hike. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm thinking about the, sh uh, the, the shame that, that, that I put myself in this situation. And it wasn't the... But you went for a hike. I mean, you shouldn't be that hard yeah. on yourself. You went for a hike. It's not like, is it... Does it sound like the safest area? No. Yeah. We all go to some areas that maybe aren't yeah, the safest. Yeah. yeah. It's life. You know? No, you're right. And and this was these were the mo the thoughts that were were occurring to me in the moment. And and the other one that like kind of came through and just bulldozed that was I like it's like you, you kind of think about all your regrets at one moment. And mm. I, I've been really fortunate to to meet some amazing people and have some really cool experiences in life. But like, I just had this one enormous regret and that's just that I didn't finish this book. Mm. It was so absolutely clear as day that that was my biggest regret in life that, that I was going to die with this book 95% done. And so anyway, the guy, he came around and I stood up, I had my backpack sort of clutched to me. Um, and he wanted my, uh, uh, he, you know, he wanted all of my, my money and my, uh, my phone and stuff. Uh, and at this point I <laughs> previously had, ha had already had my, my credit cards, uh, like, uh, stolen in, in South Africa because of another thing, but I, I was just dumb and, and gave them to a, a con man basically. Hmm. Um, and Not so Matt like, Cox, I hope. You say again? Not Matt Cox. Didn't recognize him. Okay. All right. That's good. <laughs> Uh, you always you always got to wonder if he went back to that. I mean, know? he's a tan guy, but <laughs> I, I don't think he'd blend in in Cape Town. You know what I mean? All right, go ahead. So the, I, I was like, I, I, I'm trying to figure out a way because if he if he takes my phone, I have no way to pay for anything. I have no way to even get back into my apartment. And I'm also blind and I just need my glasses. Like if, if he can just give me my glasses, then I can get out of there. He can have the phone. And I'm like, but like there's no way – that I'm going to be able to like get off of this mountain with him back there and me blind. So, uh, he's holding the knife up to me and I'm like, look, just, if you just give me my glasses, I'll do, I'll give you whatever you want. And so how old was this guy? Oh, I can tell, uh, twenties. Oh, you can't see. I forgot. Yeah. 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 And he had a mask on and he had a, yeah, yeah. maybe twenties. Um, uh, but he's kind of standing under me on the on the incline, and um, he's he's got this knife up, and then uh, weirdly he's like, 
okay, I'll find, help you find your glasses. And I was like, uh, okay. And Thank then, you. And he like, he drops the knife a little bit when he says that. And I was like, it's like, is, are you an intern? Like, is this... <laughs> Listen, keep it up. Am keep I, it up. Am I like mugging one? <laughs> am I the first mugging that you've ever done? Uh, and so he, he like dropped the knife a little bit. And then I was like, oh, my glasses are right there. And then he looked down and he dropped the knife like even more. And then I just football kicked him right in the Son head. Son of a bitch. Yeah. And then. In the head. Yes. Like face or like face. side of the head. Face. Yep. Damn. And then I, I got on top of him and, and you know, we were wrestling for the knife for a bit. Um, oh, shit. So he had the knife in his hand. Yeah. And you're wrestling for Yep. It. Yep. Now, that's the scariest thing you've said so far. Well, so all he's got to do is. Th- no, this to me is the scarier part because so I'm on top of him and we're uh, we're wrestling for the knife. I'm kind of trying to, to beat the knife out of his hand. Mind you, I have taken like, you know, all together maybe two months of bjj and some like gym boxing classes that's about it that's uh, that's enough to you know i was also on dance team in high school so (laughs) you were doing so well you had to say that i i was on i was on competitive dance squad you know what your footwork though is going to be excellent (laughs) fantastic yeah and your hand eye is going to be pretty good from that i disarmed him with a tour jeté um with a what that's a it's a dance term is that like a french ass term or some shit a french dance term yeah no so anyway, shit. I was fighting this gentleman, <laughs> um, and uh, and yeah, so I'm on top of him, and I'm I'm just sort of pushing, putting pressure on his throat. But then I look down at him because like uh, now I'm close enough to see what's going on, and I realize that his his face is actually covered in blood, and then I realize that it's not his blood; it's mine. Oh wait, that took an unexpected twist. Yeah, I'm leaking from my head fast because i'm by the way i'm looking at your head while you're saying this i'm like damn he must have just grazed you but it's up in your hair because in my hair yeah got it um i and also i look the amount of time that i've spent thinking like if the knife was just a little bit sharper if it was if he had a little bit more leverage if he had any i mean yeah, and you can think about that until you're insane. You must have looked like such a savage. I'm just picturing this guy like wrestling with this dude who has now taken him down, who he oh. started to try to assail, who's got blood dripping from him and has hit it's like Mel Gibson in the in the Patriot. I've never seen somebody look at me like that and it was it was really frightening because it's like you 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 you're looking at somebody who who thinks that you're going to kill them and it's like I just want to get off of this mountain and it's also like the whole the whole like just being in that violent confrontation is kind of fucking goofy. Did you want to kill him? No, no, no. That never cre- like in because it would have been defense. Like yep. in that moment, you're thinking this guy has a knife. I don't. If I got a free shot to like pound his head mm. right into the sand and he dies, hey, I live. No, you never thought that. No, because the the knife was gone. Like I, as soon as like I started beating his hand, his the the knife was out of the picture. Oh, so at this point, when you're on top of him and he's seeing your face, yeah. the knife's already gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and you still like in. I'm thinking of all the juices flowing through you right now. You didn't have like the I need to neutralize the situation. If he dies, he dies. The thing that snapped me out of it was seeing his eyes and seeing seeing his face covered in my blood. Like that was horrifying. How long did it take for you to realize it was your blood and not his? Well, I saw because I, I was on top of him, so I saw it leaking out of uh-huh. my head. Yeah, and so yeah it um like that that complete like now i'm i'm in my body i know what's going on here and like immediately i'm thinking like how bad is this i can't look at myself like how am i like i I know that they always say that head wounds bleed a lot which they certainly do um but i don't know how bad i'm hurt and i'm just thinking like i've got to get off of this mountain as quickly as possible and so at a certain point, I'm just like, are we done? We're done, right? And then he starts crying. Um, and he's like, I got to give, you know, I've got to give the, these people something. And I'm like, I, I don't, I got to go. <laughs> like, I'm bleeding from the head, man. I don't know what to tell you. Got to give what people something? I'm guessing he had bosses or something. I don't know. But I ended up giving him, like, my rain jacket, which I <laughs> needed, like, a week later. I totally needed that jacket, and I liked that jacket too. I gave him like the rain jacket uh, and like a, a pack of cigarettes. Did um, you how, like how calm? Like how long did it take for you to go to calm and chill? Like you're on him, 
you decide, okay, he doesn't have a knife, it's neutralized. Like, was it just like, hey, man. Oh, no, I was not calm and chill at all. I started crying, too. I was like, I was like, what are we doing here? (laughs) What? What? We could just stop this. I'm in the Peace Corps. We could stop this at any point and just not fight one another. I was having a very pleasant afternoon <laughs> listening to a mycology podcast. Um, yeah, no, like, I, I, at no point was I, like, Calm. you know, yeah. no, like, I, it, I, it would be so awesome if I was, like, fucking Jean-Claude Van Damme and, and you know, just kicking ass. I was just like, what's happening? This doesn't need to happen. Are you still holding him? Are you yeah, holding I'm, I'm, his arms? I'm holding, I'm holding you got his hand where, on his neck? Yeah, I have my, my uh, forearm on his neck and, and. Have his Where are his legs? Behind you? Behind You're right me. full on he's, top of him? He's down the mountain. I'm full on. I've straddled his chest. Your knees are on his chest? No, either side. Either side of his chest. And my, mm. my forearm is on him. And Cowgirl. Yeah. Gotcha. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Orthodox cowgirl. <laughs> uh, not the reverse variety. Real quick, to all my Discord people out there, the Julian Dory Discord is officially live. I put the link down in the description below. So go hit that, join the community, and say what's up. There's all kinds of features in there, and I look forward to hearing from you guys. Let's get it popping. Um... Yeah, so uh, I was, uh, you know, his hand was hurt, and he seemed out of it, and he was covered in my blood. I was covered in his blood. Everybody's crying. Uh, <laughs> I was like, I gotta go. <laughs> and so I just kind of, you know, hightailed it down to the nearest neighborhood, which wait wasn't a minute, that. Wait a minute. So you come off him. Now yeah. you're not straddling him anymore. Yeah. Did he just lay there? Yeah. He didn't move. He was not. Did you, like, back up watching him? I was like, I, I, I uh, no, like I kind of had like a hand on him still, but like, yeah, no, he was, he was done. Like, All right, so hold on, you get up yeah. like this, mm-hmm. kind of like hand on him, yeah. like kneeling a little bit, and then you back to get off my backpack, like, back yeah, off like that, yep, and like you're just backing up. I'm your like, backpack. yeah, I'm just like, like I'm worried that he's gonna follow me. His hands all fucked up. How far away is your backpack? Oh, it's arms reach. Arms reach. Yeah, because so I had it on me when when he went right before I kicked him. So you pick up the backpack and then I just still kinda... looking at him. He's still laying there. Is he looking at you? Is he looking? No, I I, I don't remember. I just turned and ran. Basically, and then you ran. Did yeah. Did you think he was following you? No, because yeah. I turned and looked back. Okay. Yeah, and he he did not seem well. And you said it was like a hundred yards away, the town. Not very far at all. Yeah, I mean, I I like I could see people in the windows. So what did you place. do when you get the, when you got there? Like, did you go just find someone right so away? So it's a like, little help me because you're bleeding. Yeah, it's a little a uh, little like um uh highway uh that goes through the the neighborhood, and uh I saw a dude that was was out there uh washing his car, and South Africa. Uh, and South Africans like are the, rightfully, you know, a bit a bit suspicious of of people just like coming up to their houses. And granted, at this point, I'm covered in blood too. Um, so <laughs> I'm probably looked like a... I, I I have a, I have a picture I can show you later. We're at the, are you serious and high strung upset, or are you back? At this point, once you get your breath and you're down there, you're kind of back to your nice, affable personality. Like, hey, hello. No, kind of like manic crazy. Still manic crazy. Yeah, yeah totally. Because it happened like, I mean, I could see, when I was talking to the dude who was washing his car, I could still see the dude who attacked me up on the mountain. And he's like, oh, when did this happen? I'm like, dude, two minutes ago, that's the guy. He's right there. And, and also, oh, you could see him. Yeah, I could still see him. Well, I mean, I, I knew where he was. I didn't have my glasses on still. Was he um, still laying there? I don't know. I didn't have my glasses on. I knew he was up there, though. Um, but yeah, so I, so the guy was like, look, you can't come into my house. Um, but I'll let you, I'll give you some like, uh, paper towels to like, you know, clean off with. And I was like, that's, that's fine. Where's a police station? (laughs) (laughs) Do they even have those around here? Oh my God. It was so terrible too. Cause Uh. like, so like he, he gives me this wad of paper to put on my head and, and so I'm, I'm, you know. Uh, sent on my way with this water paper and a general impression of where the police station is um and i walk down the hill and then i run into these like two english like really old english dudes who uh, i like have a bunch of hiking gear and i'm like are are you guys going hiking up there right now and they're like <laughs> yeah don't go I, I, maybe you shouldn't <laughs> yeah 
And, it, and, and they're like, oh, oh my God, what's happened? Like, Weird story. <laughs> it's just been. You should have, you should have totally. Yeah, never mind. So, uh, like, the, the uh, English guy, uh, this old ass English guy, was like, um, you know, oh, we'll take you to the police station. Um, so I get in his car, and, and, you know, it's still, it's still kind of COVID times. And so he's like, I'm sorry, I don't have a mask. And I'm like, I don't. That's the least of my worries. Give a buddy. shit, man. <laughs> I really don't care. I'm I'm bleeding from my head right now, and so it's super super good oh for God. you looking out for that. But I'm really not bothered. This story has everything in it, man. And so we get to the police station, and um, you know they have weird regulations so that they can only have like one or two people in there at once. And so like I'm waiting outside. Uh, and I'm like, you know, still bleeding with like these paper towels on my head. And I go in eventually and there's like uh, another couple in there and I like kind of walk up and I figure they're going to like notice that I'm, you know, not there to, to um, you know, pay a parking ticket because <laughs> of the blood <laughs> and everything. <laughs> and I've never I've never walked into a room where I, you know, was was sort of clearly injured. Um, right. And and also at this point, like, I think maybe it was it was a function of the adrenaline or whatever. It might exactly. have been... It might yes. have been the adrenaline wearing off, but immediately I felt so thirsty. Like, thirstier than I've ever felt in my life. Like, my mouth was so dry. And I mean, it's not like, you know, walking around, like, at a... <laughs> California, and I had an Nalgene. Um, <laughs> granted it was back on the mountain at this point. Um, but like, I was just super, super thirsty. So I was like, okay, well I need to like get, like make a police report and maybe they'll, and they'll probably like give me a bottle of water or something. So like I go up and I'm like, Hey, can I make a police report? Cause I got attacked. And then they're like, Oh no, you got to go to the hospital first. I'm like, yeah, but the hospitals have like these really long lines cause of COVID and, and like, can I just make a police report? Like it doesn't seem like it's like, I don't think I need like any hardcore medical care right now but like i'd just like to make a police report and go home and they're like nope gotta go to the hospital first i'm like oh, okay um uh can i have a bottle of water and they're, they're like no sorry you can't um the bathroom's closed because of covid come on and i was like uh, 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 how, how is this how is this happening and the the lady next to me who was there paying a parking ticket was like, hey, we'll take you to like you know the the South African version of a Wawa and get you a bottle of water. And she like took me by the hand, <laughs> so blind without my damn glasses, and uh, you know we got a bottle of water. And she's like, you want to ride home? And I say yes, and and they drop me off back at home. And I at this point was sort of in these weird waves of like manic laughter and and you know uh adrenaline uh fueled rambling like i was calling my friends and being like holy shit you'll never guess what happened mm. and i like got out of my clothes and then i realized that they were just like doused in blood and not only did they were they like covered in blood but they like there were there were cuts across my back too oh shit yeah because you were rolling yeah. yeah and so and, and then like you know other um you know, other places that I didn't, I didn't feel like I got hit at at all. It's the afterward is this, this whole bit. Um, uh, granted, I, I just told a more detailed version of it. Um, <laughs> I left out the old English man. Oh shit. Yeah. This is like the afterwards, like three pages. We really got the inside story here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is, these are the full details. Um, and so then I, um, I strangely went afterwards, like the next couple of days, I felt like it was a weird behavior to do, but like I, I even noticed it was weird at the time, but like I just kind of left my bloody clothes just like hanging out there in like the apartment that I was renting, like sort of in the, like laid out in the shape of, of like, you know, me. Why? Still don't know. I think it was, I felt like I was kind of sometimes a little bit fascinated by them. Sometimes. You were um, fascinated by them. Yeah, I mean, like, I was trying to sort of, like, CSI what, where each of the the bruises came from, or, 
maybe sort of convince myself that like I had just been through that thing. For some reason, I was like pacing around these clothes like they were like they were furniture in the room. Sounds like a like a very normal, natural from a high octane, life changing, life threatening event. Like PTS type symptom. Yeah, it was. It and and then I I felt this r- insane drop the next three days after that. Like I I basically just laid on the couch in the place that I was I was living, and I felt like I watched the sun come up and go down for three days without moving, mm. and and I w- just kept thinking about that that one thing that was so clear on that mountain when the guy was coming towards me with the knife and it's just like that this book wasn't finished and that like that's why that's why it got done like i had to i had to put in the i had to put away the idea that it was going to be this big publisher hit that it was going to be a documentary that was going to be all of these things. And then just remember that this is a uniquely important story that I went and spent a year of my life researching for a reason that there is important things to stay, to stay here. And that it really didn't matter if I put it out independently or not, that I, I wasn't going to the grave without writing this full book. Well, I'm glad you did, man. Me too. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. I, I hate that this was like the final thing to have to make it happen, but glad you survived. Yeah. Shit. I mean, uh, that's how I feel. That's how I feel about a lot of, a lot of the, the stuff that happens in this book too. Cause it's like, you know, I think you, you owe it. If you, if you do stuff like this, like if you, if you, I think you have a responsibility to your community, to the lar- or the world at large, that if you spend time on the fringes or if you do things that, that carry with it a mortal danger, you need to bring back some of that experience and you need to share that with others. Because if you don't, you're, you're just an adrenaline junkie. Mm. You know, if you don't, you're just a war tourist. And and you're not again, you know, a you're war not war tourist. Wow. Yeah, there's a war tourist in this book. Um, uh, met met her in uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan. She she got a job. Uh, <laughs> she got a job as a third grade teacher just to be near the war. Just no like, dude. She, no plan to communicate anything about it. Just to be there. She was. I'll never understand what what her deal was. I, I call her I call her Claire in the book. Um, but. Okay, What's so, her real name? I don't. You remember. can keep it between you and me. Yeah, <laughs> just you and me. <laughs> um, uh, no, so like the first day that I met her, the, we were talking about, uh, you know, we we're in a session about like uh, positive reinforcement for like the kids. It's like you know what's culturally good, like our high fives, okay, that kind of thing. Um, and then she's just like in front of everybody, is just like, well, these kids have seen their their families murdered by the Islamic State, and our principal is like no not no these kids probably haven't you know there it's a lot of international kids um, and she was disappointed yeah she just oh, kept no. she kept mumbling about terrorism under her breath like oh, next to me no. so that uh, i could hear what a weirdo and then you know she call uh, she comes up to me in in line at the cafeteria and she's like where do you live i'm like the same building you do <laughs> <laughs> we took the same bus this morning <laughs> like and she's she's goes well, okay, you're on the sixth floor, though. That's a problem. Um, I'm having a meeting with some special forces guys so that we can exfiltrate if shit hits the fan. Oh my and I'm God. like, lady, I haven't, I haven't been here. I got here like 12 hours ago, and I am not even unpacked. Oh. And you're like, we're going to exfiltrate you. What? You should have called her Karen so it could be War Karen. Dude, at, at one point, this is no shit. She, there's, there's, there's fighting about to start in Kirkuk, right? Um, so what happens is the Kirkuk, Kirkuk is the, uh, is, uh, so, um, Iraqi Kurdistan kind of, uh, goes along the, um, north, it'd be the northeastern edge of what we know as the borders of federal Iraq. So it touches Iran, it touches, uh, uh, Turkey, and then, uh, uh 
federal Iraq or the Republic of Iraq takes over. And then I'll it goes put a to, screenshot map in the corner. Goes so that to we Syria. Have that. Yeah. So within this bowl is the area of Kirkuk, and Kirkuk is a majority is like this major oil producing region. Historically, it was Kurdish. Um, Saddam Hussein uh, enacted a policy of Arabization on the mm. area. Uh, so he uh, essentially wanted people that were loyal to him to live on this land that was was oil producing and, and quite wealthy. In uh, 2017, uh, Kirkuk wanted to join with the uh, uh, Kurdish regional government, the KRG or Iraqi Kurdistan, to uh, gain independence from the, the Republic of Iraq themselves. Uh, however, Republic of Iraq was not going to let that happen. Uh, the vote went through, and I think it, they voted themselves away and independent from uh, the Republic of Iraq with 92% saying yes to leave. Um, and Iraq basically said, no, you didn't. So they shut down the airspace of uh, the Kurdish region. And they rolled tanks into Kirkuk to secure the, the region from, you know, uh, believing that it was a part of the uh, the Iraqi Kurdish region. Um, and there was a brief fight between the Kurdish Peshmerga and uh, the Republic of Iraq, their troops. Um, so Claire was like, I'm going to go there. And she was so... What year is this? This is 2017. So she... Okay. And and mind you, we're like we're all we're all third grade teachers, you know. We're <laughs> we're we're sitting in a teaching in a teacher's lounge, grading handwriting books and spelling papers. She wants war. I said, that's all she wants, and she's like, and she like just out of nowhere one day she's like, I went to Kirkuk over the weekend, and we're like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And she was like, I. So what I did was, and it's like nobody like nobody <laughs> wants this story. <laughs> And it's not, it's like, unfortunately, it's not necessarily just that, like, yeah, you probably shouldn't go to an active war zone for no reason. But it was like, dude, we're going to have to teach your classes when mm. you get kidnapped or killed. Like, sold into slavery. We don't, yeah. we don't need more classes. I'm already teaching eight hours a day. Um, and she's like, I dressed in a full hijab. And I'm like, that's not even, like, it's, it's not even exactly the the style of dress that everybody's like in, and also you're like six one. She's a tall lady, um, and then she was like, "But I was thinking about dressing like a man, just to like blend in." And I'm like, <laughs> "What?" <laughs> and I was oh like, "Oh my god!" I I want. Um, god bless her. <laughs> So yeah, like is she this, dead or alive? I think she's back in the United States. Uh, well, that's that's yeah. good. For I hope all so. Parties. I hope so. <laughs> that's good for yeah. all parties. She and I, she and I, definitely butted heads quite a few times, um, because it's like, yeah, I, I, I but it, back to the the point that I was trying to make. It's like if you if you spend time in these places, like you you owe it to to people to bring back some of that experience and to in whatever way suits you uh so that you're not just an adrenaline junkie so that you're not just a yeah. war tourist like because that's just you know it, it, like that's the that's the height of privilege like you're you're so privileged and you're so bored that like you're gonna go to a war zone to get your kicks like that's the that's so like that's so selfish because you're not only putting yourself in danger but you're putting other people in danger mm. right um how much time how long were you in that area Mm, it was like four months. Um, but what ended up happening was, um, uh, I think it was like, yeah, three or four months. I left in, would have been late December, late December of 2017. Um, and I know this specifically because, so I had a, I had a girlfriend who was in uh, Bulgaria at the time. She was a Fulbright scholar in Bulgaria. Mm. Now I was trying to leave the car. I, I wanted to leave the country to go, um, to go see her. Uh, for Christmas and New Year's, and uh, Iraq had shut down the airspace, so I couldn't fly out of uh, the Kurdish region at this point. Um, but I could take a bus to the first border town on the other side of um, 
uh, of Iraqi Kurdistan and Turkey and then just fly from there. So that was my plan. Crossed out of the country that way. Uh, got a Turkish visa because uh, you can get it on arrival. Flew to, um, uh, I guess it was Istanbul and then to see her in Bulgaria. Hung out for a couple of days, had Christmas. Then we were like, well, let's go meet my friend in, in Istanbul and, and, you know, hang out for, for New Year's. So we were planning on doing New Year's in Istanbul. So this Istanbul be, seems like such a cool city, man. one of my favorite cities in the world. It's a city that connects Europe and Asia, right? It's so cool. I love that city. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's one of, the mo- one of the most beautiful places. Um, and it also ha- – it's like – it's not beautiful in the same way that like Vienna is beautiful where it's it's like you're walking through a museum. It's beautiful because it's like – got this soaring architecture but it's also super deeply human like you Mm. you feel it feels lived and it feels like human beings are are having their lives and making their stories in this city and have for thousands of years it's so cool um so we decided to go to istanbul Istanbul, and uh there's a train that goes from sofia to istanbul it's an overnight train and uh we get a sleeper car Woken up at, uh, you know, three o'clock in the morning for the uh, border check for the the passport thing. And uh, really cold on the border uh, because, you know, it's it's, uh, late December and guys are checking our passports. We both have Turkish visas because we had been been through there and uh, border guards are like, okay, well, where do you live? Uh, my girlfriend at the time said Bulgaria and, um, then a guy asked me where I lived and it's three o'clock in the morning. I don't like, and I say three syllables that like changed my life entirely. I live in Kurdistan, Kurdistan. And then the Turkish border guards are like, where do you live? And I was like, oh no, because the Turks are not cool with any sort of independent independence movement from Kurdistan. Yeah, because that's not a recognized... Oh, so I said the name of a country that doesn't exist. And mind you, at this point, the book is supposed to just be about what it's like to be in this country that didn't exist previously and now exists, for better or worse. Granted, it didn't... Like, the, the referendum didn't lead to an independent Kurdish state. But that was what this book was about. And so the uh, the Turkish authorities say, okay, well, um, you're coming Come with, with us. us. <laughs> and uh, we we both go to get interrogated in separate rooms. Oh, uh, no. And uh, I, uh, I'm having a really interesting interrogation with my my you know, Turkish border patrol officer, because like, it's, it's, he's, he's like both good cop and bad cop at the same time. So it's like really confusing cop. So we'll be kind of buddy, buddy. And I think that like, he's going to be like, oh, this is all just like some crazy mix up. Don't worry about it. And you know, you, of course you guys have a great time in Istanbul. Um, and then, you know, I'd sit back and like cross my leg and he like swap me in the legs and be like, sit up straight. And I was like, holy shit, like what what's happening? And so of course, I mean, as you well know, like my fact pattern looks a little strange. Like <laughs> I've got, I have Kurdish work papers, I have an American passport, um, and I have an ID for, as a third grade teacher. Um, and I'm also going to grad school at the time, so so my and I went to went to Oxford, so I have my like Oxford ID. And so like those are my personal effects. That I ha- and he's like, make these all make sense together. I'm like, I'm, you know, my thesis project is writing a book about unrecognized nations. That's why I'm here. I'm teaching third grade. And he's like, so you're a spy. You crossed over the border from, you know, the area that's sort of uh, filled with with uh, the the Kurdish Workers Party. Why would you cross over that border? I'm like, I can't because I can't, you know, the, the airspace is shut down. I can't fly out of Iraqi Kurdistan. And then he takes out my camera. And I had just been at a rally for Kurdish independence. Oh, no. And I did not take that memory card out. And I had probably 400 photos of just nothing but hyper Kurdish nationalism. And so he's just flipping through all of them. And I'm like, I am so fucked right now. For whatever reason, and thank God... He didn't. He decided that that they were just going to boot us out, and so they we. Received, and you were already leaving. 
Yeah, well, we were going to go to to Istanbul, but at this point we weren't. Um, <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, so uh, it, you know they they give us some paperwork that says you're banned from Turkey. Um, oh, so you can't go back to Turkey, and that meant I couldn't go back to Iraqi Kurdistan either because the airspace was shut. So now I'm just on the border of uh, you know Turkey and Bulgaria. It's three o'clock in the morning. And they're like walk to the next town, which is a town called Svilingrad. And I'm like, what the fuck are we gonna do? And uh, fortunately, there was a there was a cab that was coming through the border for one of the hotels at one time, and he he saw that we were in dire straits, and he he was like, uh, yeah, get on, get in, we'll we'll take you to Svilingrad. And How'd you did you couldn't get back at all then? I would have to it, Kurdistan. Nope, I had to say goodbye to everything there. You never went back. Nope, lost my job, lost my apartment, lost all my clothes, lost. I I only had money in my boot. You couldn't get anything mailed back. No, no, I it was it was all done. Listen to me, the Mister American here, thinking <laughs> I can just FedEx everything. Christ. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, nobody, and also nobody from the school is going to be like, man, yeah, r- r- rough, rough time, Eric had. Let's let's FedEx him his uh, his his clothes. Where'd you keep your money? In my boot. I usually keep it in my boot. So yeah. All right. So you had that with you? Yeah, I I walked out. Well, because I knew that there was a possibility. <clears throat> That so you kept cash in your boot? Yes, they paid me in cash in in Erbil. How much cash did you have in American U.S. dollars? Maybe two, three grand, something like that. That's not a lot. No, I know, I know, and it's certainly not enough to fund the rest of my travel. So anyway, I was trying to like re-figure out what what I was going to do with my life at this point because like, oh well, shit, there goes my book. My book is gone. Um, and I was like, okay, well, there are other unrecognized nations, right? Or or there are nations that are struggling for full recognition. So why don't I just go to those? And so I was like, well, the thing that kicked this off in the first place was when I went to uh, Kosovo for the f- fifth year anniversary back in back when I was in the Peace Corps. And I was like, wow, this this country five years ago was was founded. So why don't I just go back to Kosovo and, and write about that? It was and what, 2013 you were there? Yeah, so it was uh, 20, 2012, 2013. As they were what? Beginning of 2008 no, it was 20, it was they were 20, founded? Uh, 1912 was, uh, 1912 was the um, uh, founding of Albania, and then, yeah, 2008 was the... Kosovo. Two, 2008, yeah. 2009. Um, so I went back to Kosovo, and it was, it as as luck would have it, that was their 10-year anniversary. And so I was like, well, that's a, that's a good moment to write about. Um, so I... And the question for Kosovo became... Okay, you have marginal independence, um, and, or you have independence, and you have you're attempting to gain full recognition. What's it like to build a country ten years on after you've gotten a country? And so, I knew that there was this uh, like culture magazine in the area, and I just knocked on their door. And a culture magazine? Yeah, it's like um, uh, it's called Kosovo Two Point Zero. Um, it's a fantastic magazine. So it's printed in Serbian and, and English and uh, and uh, ship the Albanian language. Um, and so I just knocked on their door and I was like, "Hey, do you need a writer? Or I can I can speak Albanian decently. So do you need anybody to do anything?" And they're like, "There's your desk. We can't pay you, but there's your desk." Mm. And so I started writing for them a little bit and and working with them. Uh, and while I was there, I was interviewing locals about what the experience with the uh you know during the war was but mostly their experience after the war and and how to what it was like to actually build a nation from the and ground up. And you said at this point it's 2018, right? This is 10 years on. Yes, 2018. Okay. Okay. Yeah, would have been. Um cuz yeah, New Year's was when we were going to Istanbul 2017 2018. Um and then uh, I was also like, well, I also have to get the Serbian point of view in this and I have to interview people like cuz you know, there are seven stars on the, the Kosovo flag, and it's f- each star is for one of the represented people groups in mm. in Kosovo. So it's not just an Albanian Kosovar story. That's And that's the thing that re- was really important for me to, to suss out. I want to stop you for one sec because mm-hmm. I want to organize this a little bit for people. So for one thing, I'm going to keep this in mind. We're going to come back to Kurdistan yeah. and Iraq. Because yeah, yeah. I have a lot of questions around that. You obviously saw, as you already hinted at, a lot of the Kurdish nationalism. And, you know, in a century, in the 20th century, where we saw so many things change in countries and and 
different cultures eventually get their quote unquote borders and have their story, you know, whether it be the Balkan nations each getting their own through a lot of different wars, mm. Israel forming in the Holy Land, all these different things. There are groups still a few groups of like somewhat large peoples around the world who don't have a land. Correct. The Kurds are huge. I forget the exact number they are. 35 million to 40 35 million. 35 million people. Mm -hmm. Think about that. 35 million people of an ethnic background, yep. a tribe who do not have a country. In an uninterrupted geographic band too. In a what? It, it's it's uninterrupted. Like the uh, there is a wide swath of region that is largely occupied in by, like yeah. Syria, Iraq. That yeah, Syria, yeah. Iraq, Iran. Yeah, it's occupied. It's so bizarre because yeah. these borders and I've talked about that. I, I should say lived in by because occupied has has like militaristic connotations. But yeah, like they live there, right? Yeah, I I had Joby Warwick in here for episode one thirty four, who's a brilliant writer with the Washington Post for many, many years. He's won a couple Pulitzers as, as well, and he wrote among his books, one of the ones that won a Pulitzer was the the book Black Flags, Rise of ISIS. The most fascinating terrorist figure I think I've ever come across. We're familiar with, with Bin Laden. Bin Laden and, and Zawahiri and his number two guy, they were of a completely different type. These were people who were professionals. Uh, Bin Laden was an engineer. His number two was a medical physician, so they're educated, uh, sophisticated people. They have sort of a strategic vision of this terrorist organization they're trying to create. So Kali was none of that. He was just a street tough. Yeah. Oh, I've been wanting to read that. I haven't oh, read it. Oh, it's though. incredible, yeah. dude. I actually have a guy who I need to be careful how I say this. A a person I know, a friend, I'll call him he is a friend, who works in he's not at one of the agencies, but he works in Intel related Got activities. It. Yep. Who has recently been heavily focused in the Middle East and he said it's not a requirement or anything but almost everyone who goes there for mm -hmm. the first time like when they're coming in they read that book yeah because it's that good wow so, I really need to read it so jo anyway Joby's Joby's incredible but you know I was talking about that with him on the podcast where you look at these borders in the Middle East and I can put just a map a screenshot of the map in the corner and it says Syria it says Iraq yeah. Iran kind of has their thing set up. But yep. like you look at all these different countries and it's like technically that's where the line is, but like just because fucking Bashar al-Assad sits in Damascus and apparently controls where these lines are doesn't mean he actually does cuz like a whole bunch of that country like he has no control over. Yeah. Like do they even pay taxes? We don't know how it works. So Well, you know how like I mean one of the, one of my favorite like it, it's it's snarky but somewhat accurate is like never trust a country with straight borders. Mm. Right? Because What do you mean by straight? Well, cuz uh, they were they were likely colonial borders if they're like a straight line and they don't go down uh, a natural yes. geographic boundary. Wow. So the borders in the Middle East were drawn post World War 1 um specifically the ones that that we're talking about here were were drawn by um uh the Sykes-Picot Treaty. Uh so it's like Mark Sykes uh, Mark Sykes and Francois Picot I think are them uh, are the are them are the names. And and basically they uh, they were it was France and the United Kingdom divvying up who got what after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Um, so they did that, and the only way that you really would do it back in the day, and you took a damn ruler and got to a map, yes. and you just drew a line. No cultural understanding whatsoever. None whatsoever. I, I would, I, that, 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 I think, would be inaccurate to say. There was, I mean, there were certainly, like, they wanted the land for a reason, so they had people who were in these regions. Yeah, um, but in drawing those maps, there's no cultural understanding whatsoever. They, no? they were they were certainly motivated by the interests of the United Kingdom yes. and by the by France, not by making sure that everybody had their land. They view the way I've read it, yeah. I'm not them, mm. obviously, but the way I've read it in the history is that they viewed it as in in for argument's sake here like a monoculture like oh yeah. that's the middle east yes 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 exactly mm -hmm. well and and interestingly enough at this exact same time there was a previous treaty to the treaty of Lausanne, which which finally ended and solidified the borders that we know um in in the middle east and and the former ottoman empire 
there was a previous treaty which had Kurdish land in it, like set aside for mm. the self-determination of, of of Kurdish people. I guess we're coming back to Kosovo, by the way. This went backwards, but it, let's it, stay with it. Yeah, I, I mean, it. look, it goes back to the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, it all yeah, does. Yeah. Um, but but that uh, that was the Treaty of Sevres, and it was eventually uh, they they eventually moved away from the Treaty of Sevres, which had uh, an apportion S E V R E S. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it, but yeah, Treaty of Severus. Okay. Um, and so that had that had a Kurdish region for self determination set aside. Um, Ataturk kept fighting in uh, the on the western flank, from what I remember, and he basically forced them, forced the Western powers to to make a, a different deal that that had the borders of Turkey what they are today. Mm. But that also didn't stop other Kurdish states from rising. So um, the Kingdom of Kurdistan was around from 1922 to 1924. Uh, there was, oh, there was another one. Did which, they have borders? Yeah, they had they had borders, and they had marginal support from, from the United Kingdom, too. Um, the, even there was one that was around for less than a year, is the Mahabad Republic, and that's in uh, northwestern Iran. Uh, and that was supported by the Soviet Union. Mm. So it's not unusual that that at this point in 2017, this region was trying to to self determine the world's. You know, if they were trying to self determine a Kurdish region. Uh, it's not unusual. In fact, it's it's you know it's the rule. It's rather not the exception. This this has been tried many times before, but because the arrival of a new country doesn't benefit. Uh, the allied, uh, you know, the the dominant military and economic powers in the world, then it's sort of refused, um, and and it leaves these individuals who want self determination in the world and who want to write their st a story on the land that they live on. Uh, it, it leaves them, according to the rest of the world, not there. So wait, how did they? How did they? What was the second one? There was the Kingdom of Kurdistan. From 1920 to 1924, you said? Mm -hmm. There was one more. I can't remember And how remember did that right end? Now. Was I it bloodshed? Um, or was it... Uh, I, I think... It's so fascinating. I like believe that. I believe the, the, the Turks basically just, just moved on it and, and were like, no, this isn't This, this is isn't our land thing. now. Yeah. And what, what was the second one called? Mm, actually, I can, I can read it right here. Um, Got yeah. the little book in front of you. I do, yeah. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Saladin the Great... <laughs> I always have him on my, my cell phone background. Um, Treaty of Lausanne. Okay. Um, okay, Kingdom of Kurdistan. So, uh, 1922, Kingdom of Kurdistan fought for sovereignty in northern Iraq for two years before it snuffed out by British-mandated Iraqi leadership. Then there was the Republic of Ararat, um, which actually has a flag that, that was... Um, it has a flag that looks a lot like the uh, the flag of the, the KRG. Um and that was in 1927, which was supported by the United Kingdom. Uh, and then the Republic of Mahabad in northwestern Iran, uh, yeah, lasted for less than a year. So the, there have been attempts to do this. And I think the thing that was really exciting for me about going to live in, in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan is like, well, wow, not only would it be possible to live in a country that uh, as, it, as it was founded – but it's the first time that like a Kurdish state was was arriving in the world. Um, Why are they not? How do they not have borders at this point? They have a government. They have militaries, mm. right? They have all these people. They exist within, as you said, the same continuous land area. Yeah. What's to stop them from just like setting up a soldier on each side and saying "fuck you, Iraq," "fuck you, Syria"? I mean, it wouldn't be hard to say that to Syria, sure. but like. This is this is officially. Well, look, this is. I mean, this is this is this goes back to to statecraft, right? Um, remember, it's generating consent amongst the governed. Uh, th th this is thirty five million people that we're talking about, and they are not a monoculture. There are there are different Kurdish languages within Kurdish, um, and they don't all agree on how they should move forward. Yeah, and and that's that's governance, right? So are they are did so you there meet are, a lot of Kurdish people who are perfectly okay calling themselves an Iraqi? I wouldn't. Uh, I I can't. I wouldn't be able to say that. Uh, that Syrian? specifically. Um, 
I what I what I would wh- who I I did meet were uh people who uh because there is a there uh, there's conflict even in the KRG right so the Peshmerga of uh out of Sulaimania Kurds yeah, yeah also Kurds but they have conflict with the the Kurds in in Erbil right they fought a civil war amongst one another what is it over. It's over, I believe that was over uh, the idea of whether or not uh, the the KRG should push forward towards like actual independence or it should just stay as an autonomous republic within federal Iraq. That doesn't make, see, that makes no sense to me. Like, and I know this is just some idiot American talking out loud. I, I understand that. I just can't. Mm. I can't process this. Well, I think uh, what's what uh, you can't process it. The be- fact that there are, we're a republic. There's one side saying we're already a republic, so we're just going to stay that way. And the it. other side saying, yeah, but we're a republic. Let's just draw a line on a map, though, and make sure other people agree to it. I don't understand. Well, like, I, I think here here's the way to to I think that that is my way into thinking about this. Right? If you have a tentative peace, but you have a peace and you have a, a stable region. Is it worth it to have a violent revolution and to fight a war? Is it worth it? Because when you draw a line on a map, at least for the most part, there's one country in this that doesn't have to fight a war and that's a pretty goofy place. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, but when you draw a line on a map, the thing that you have to sign on for first and foremost is we're going to spill a lot of blood and we're going to spill a lot of treasure. So on the other side of it, is it worth it to say that you're an independent country? But right now, do Iraq or Syria get anything from a financial perspective, any benefit, whether that be using being able to utilize the resources, being paid tax, whatever, from the Kurdish occupied areas? Yeah. Oh, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Okay. See, and, that's the misconception I right. have because the way you read this when you read books that are describing this area, they sound autonomous. They sound like they if they are. got a bill in the mail from yeah. Iraq, they'd be like, yeah, fuck yeah. you. No, they but they work together. I mean, they are autonomous, but they also are like they they do work together. There are, you know, there are Kurds who are are in the uh Iraqi parliament. Um so there it's it's an autonomous region. Um, in, uh, I wouldn't say in the same way, but there are, there are places in the world that have regions that, that are operating autonomously that still have a relationship to a centralized government government. And of course, Syria is a totally different animal, um, than the, the government system of, uh, the KRG versus the Republic of Iraq. Uh, they, I can't remember what the, the, um, acronym they have there is, but it's an, the autonomous autonomous area of northeastern syria i think it's called okay um and there are kurds living there but it's also there's there's a great amount of diversity there too so uh and there's a diversity of of governmental systems there there's a diversity of languages you not only have kurds but you have assyrians you have um uh, yazidi you have yeah. arabs um so it's just because people are from the same ethnic people group doesn't mean that they view their their future the same. I just can't fathom the idea. I because I, I obviously yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. how large groups of people work. You have right. different people with different political opinions. Mm-hmm. I can't fathom the idea of not wanting to have your own republic. And part of that is the bias of the fact that I live in a country where that is what people did eventually. They're right. like, yo, fuck the Brits. But in fairness to buttress your argument here there were plenty of people who said no we're a loyalist we're, we're not gonna we're not gonna fight britain this is fine yeah but i just don't like the loyalists descended instantly like or very recently from britain mm. right like they th- half of them came here like that generation right so they're still like they know britain these people are their own people and they've been that way for generations and generations and generations and generations so they may all, many of them, not all of them, but many of them may ascribe to like Sunni Islam, which is a common mm-hmm. religion with some of the Islamic yeah. sects there. But I don't understand how they would ever feel like, yeah, you know what? We're a part of Syria. That's fine. Mm-hmm. I like, you understand why I can't process that I mentality? Do. And and part of it too is, is the idea that like we all have different identities at different times. 
and the the point at which it becomes critical to your identity to fight to engage in violence in order to uh or you know to engage in in uh, years and years of diplomacy to to draw a line on a map because your your one identity dictates that, um, you know that's that's a matter of the leaders of your country. That's a matter of of the appetite for uh for violence for warfare that they have. I mean, I was being driven in a, a cab by a guy after there was some fighting in Kirkuk, and. We were just talking. And he he mentioned that he was fighting over over like the past weekend, and I'm like, "You're you're driving a cab now," and he's like, "I know, but like I'm I'm driving a cab. Like I got to make money, but I'm still a Peshmerga." And, and it's like, so you're not getting paid enough to to like take care of your family. You're you're still driving mm. a cab right now, so it's almost like you're you're being paid in a kind of patriotism. You're being paid in in mm. the the future tense of your country and and i don't think that's that dissimilar from from people hyper nationalist hyper nationalistic people in in you know other countries that aren't actively engaged in warfare um you know sometimes the uh the the people who are are the most um uh, uh, feverishly nationalistic are the people for whom the country has done the least right can you explain that? Yeah, well, I mean, think about it. I might there, be thinking about that wrong, but there, uh, you, if you've ever seen, oh, go ahead. All right, yeah, that, that just hit. It took a minute. Go ahead. Yeah, well, it's like it's like uh, people who are are a part of a country and and they've they're you know they're in poverty. They're actively in poverty, but God damn it, they believe in their country. Yes, you know they no, and yeah. maybe they believe in their country the absolute most. And and it's like they that's, just feel like they don't the country doesn't work for them anymore, so they want to take it back. Yeah, it's probably a good part of it, but it's it's that it's that identity because your own personal identity plugs in to the story of your nation. Yes. And as your identity plugs into it, no matter how small you are, you become greater. You become a part of the story. Because god damn it, I landed on the moon. You know? <laughs> I wasn't even alive when there was when the moon landing happened. But I landed on the moon because mm. God damn it, I'm American. You know, you get to enjoy all of the benefits of of what your country has have accomplished, but blind nationalism comes in where you don't you don't identify with any of the the darkness that your country has done, right? And, and what are you talking about right now? By the way, well, I mean, no, no, no. What are you talking about? Oh, specifically in America. I mean, no, like, no, no, no. What is the what is the underlying? It's going to be obvious when I say it because okay, it's yeah. your own term yeah, yeah. here. But you're talking about people following stories. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's all it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it and and again, it's like the if I have one mes the message that I want to get across, it's like you don't have to believe all of it. But that doesn't yes. mean that it's not important. That it's so important. It's critical. This is uh, countries are they're critical illusions that become the invisible architecture of our world they are a place for our individual identity to become a part of something greater to become a part of the conversation of the globe as well as to be a part of the history of the world that's a powerful thing yes and it's an incredible thing but we can't be hypnotized into believing that that story is absolutely 100% perfect. Like if you're if you're actually serious about loving your country, it's the same thing as like being absolutely serious about loving a, a, a human being, right? Mm -hmm. You have to be critical when it's important. You know, if you if you're with somebody and then they develop a, a drinking problem or or uh, you know they're they're engaging in in activities that are are a disaster for them you're going to tell them and so if you're serious about loving your country i think that it demands your criticism and it demands you to look at it in a clear way and that doesn't mean that you can't be so proud of everything that that has been collectively achieved by your forebears i think that that's an incredible part of it and again you know these countries allow us to 
interoperate with people we have no reason to trust, right? People we do not know. And yet we work together because mm. we vaguely believe the same story. We That's believe remarkable. In, we believe in the same type of sandbox. Right. That's all it is. We're playing by the same rules. Yeah, it's it's a... I think about this from the perspective of the fact that you look at groups of people who form around political ideologies as their religion per se in this country now. And one of the, as we see like the extreme divide continuing to grow and grow and grow because the loudest people who get the most attention are the extremes because they get the most comments, which drives the algorithm because people are either rapidly agreeing or rapidly disagreeing. right? Right. And you look at these, there seems to be this thing where I had mentioned earlier the idea that people, maybe it was off camera, but people believe we, we kind of have people now who believe nothing or people who believe everything. Yeah. And the answer is neither. And you've been pointing that out beautifully throughout this whole conversation. But you also have people who are purporting to love all the benefits they get from living here, even if they don't say it, while also pretending that everything that we've ever done is bad. Yeah. Right? And Beautiful that, way of saying that. That is such a horrible way to look at it in the same breath as being able to properly teach something like slavery and, and the black eye on our history that that is like all nations, even the great ones have black eyes. You should be able to say that the constitution and the idea of how this nation was formed and many of the things that they got right was absolutely incredible. You know, human beings are are very, very flawed. And, and we, in my lifetime, we always will be. And I think, I'm not sure there's a scenario that we can see in any type of scope of reality in any type of near future where it wouldn't be that way. But, you know, you part of what makes life so interesting is the fact that we do have the struggle with those flaws and we rise above them eventually. And maybe, unfortunately, there's a lot of pain on the way there. I mean, you and I both like like looking at World War One and World War Two from a historical perspective. They're the most important events to happen, especially World War Two in the last thousand years in the world, right? They were terrible. Right. The things that happened were unfathomable. People were genocided at at rates that you, you can't even imagine in the middle of that war. On top of all the, I forget what percentage of the world died, like in that thing. I, it, like so much so that I think it actually changed the climate. Yes, like, it, it's yeah. fucking unfathomable. Yeah. And yet. The things that ended up coming from that have shaped the world as we know it in a lot of good ways today. Sure. Like it's a good thing Mm. that Nazi Germany was stopped. Agreed. It sucks how it had to happen. It sucks that it happened in the first place. Right. But it's a very good thing that we went in there and stopped it. You know, and so sometimes I feel like people can't hold two thoughts at the same time. And, you know, maybe that's more... Maybe that's, or excuse me, less of just an American problem that I think it is. Maybe even in places that aren't maybe as focused on who's bitching on social media because they have more important things to worry about, like some of the places we're talking about right now. Maybe there is, as you're describing, some of those monoculture battles that happen where it's like, no, it's all this way or no, it's all that way. And people can't even agree on shit to be able to draw their own lines for a border. Right. Yeah. That's well, crazy. And, and, you know, one of the things that, that, I don't know. I, I think actually my best friend Dave once said this. Like, <laughs> this is a great, great thing he said. He was like, the thing about, about achieving your dreams is it's not really hard. It's just really hard. You know, you get it? Mm. It's just really hard to do. And I, I, I take this to the point of like uh, the wicked problems in the world. So there's, a, there's actually this term. It's called wicked problem. Uh, and I think it comes from programming. Um, but the idea of a, a wicked problem is... It's a problem where you can see the output of it, but you don't know what the input is that is causing the problem. Mm. So in the in the world of, of programming, from my understanding anyway, or, or large systems, you've got all these feedback loops that are going at once, and somehow they're causing this issue that happens. You can consider uh, homelessness a wicked problem, right? Because... Everybody wants to say there's one cause of it. It's like, it's just uh, the prison system. It's just mental health. It's just addiction. Well, it's it's not, not one. It's all of them. It's a wicked problem. There are all of these feedback mm. loops that are going into solving the problem. So if solving the problem was easy, it would have been solved. And so 
I think per your point about the people who enjoy all the benefits of the United States while also uh, being the loudest voices and criticizing it, I think that there's a, mis- a misapprehension of how hard it is to solve these problems, how hard it is to create a nation, how hard it is to uh, to create universal justice. These are uh. remarkably difficult things that that our system is imperfectly moving towards on a constant basis. And the contribution that I see sometimes is what I would term feeling bad in the right direction. You know, like, like, oh, I feel horrible about this social ill. Cool. What does that do? I get it. You feel really bad about this. I see what you're this, saying. But like, what is, what did you do? What did, did what are you going to do about did it? Did that help anything? Yeah. Like, it might just be that that's a really hard problem to solve. Um, and we can't turn back the clock. But and, people also want to be on a team when they do that. No. Yeah. It's, it's signaling, certainly. Yeah. But I, I think that it's, it's so important to like, uh, to to be empathetic towards people who are identifying, you know, all of these problems, mm-hmm. and of course you want to do something, um, but you know, I saw this, I saw this in in Peace Corps and and in interactions with with aid workers, where it's like, if people try to shoulder all of the burdens of the world, they'll be crushed underneath it. If they if they make the uh, there's a there's a line from a wonderful poem and I'm gonna butcher it but it's so good. Uh, it's called uh, a brief for the defense by Jack Gilbert, but the line is something along the lines or uh, something along, yeah. So the the line goes I think, um, uh, you know, to make to make tragedy the only measure of your attention is to quite literally praise the devil. Mm. I might have gotten that line wrong, but it's that's the meaning behind it. If you make only the darkness of the world the full measure of your attention, yes, you are praising the devil. Because you put all the focus on it. Exactly. You don't put any focus on good. Mm-hmm. But we're also wired that way, which is part of the problem. You know, human beings came out of the evolution of running from the fucking bear and getting to the cave for, yeah. you know, to survive to fight another day. You know, there was threats everywhere that's in our biological. We're no different than animals in that way. We may have just, you know, gotten to this point where now we can build these weird things from wood and throw some windows in it so you could see outside (laughs) it and, you know, go to bed at night and and use an iPhone to set your alarm to wake up in the morning and And your heart rate at night. Yeah, and like worry how how it's going to be really hot tomorrow. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But the evolution of negativity is still in there. Absolutely. Human beings are wired to be negative. We are wired for the first thought to be negative because it's not because we're negative Nancy. It's because there's something that to different varying degrees from the degree of, oh, I'm not, I didn't drink enough water today to, oh shit, my buddy got hit by a car and died today. There's different varying degrees of things that relate back somehow to our inherent survival or trying to fight off death. And so when we see things that are wrong in the world, we see death. And in many cases, it actually, it actually is. It may not be on our doorstep, but we want to, we feel a need to have to share that. You feel a need to have to call someone when you hear something bad and tell them about it. This, you know? this relates exactly, exactly to what you're talking about with, with Kurdistan and, and exactly to uh, the self-determination of nations. How? Because it has everything to do with your individual identity. When you feel that your identity is being threatened, you feel like your life is being threatened, right? Wow. The best way, I say in the book a couple of times, one of the best ways that you can have a civil war, if you're a dictator is to stop people from speaking their own language. It happened in Kosovo. It happened in uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan. Like, like literally? Like literally make their language illegal, right? How did that happen in Kurdistan? Uh, they were, uh, so uh, institutions were not allowed to have, have Kurdish language institutions, schools, um, hospitals. Same in Kosovo. They did the same thing. They said no more speaking Albanian in, in your schools and hospitals. And so the Albanian population decided to homeschool everybody, right? You start chipping away at somebody's identity, 
and they become very, very dangerous. It scares me to think about that because I see I see the two respective political parties in this country doing that. And they they and this is this is the process that I was talking about earlier. Is that this is the idea of schismogenesis? So yes, please explain this because yeah. I have tried to explain this and did never realize there was a term for it. This is beautiful. Yeah, I and shout out to to David Graeber for this. Um, I think it was David Graeber. Um, anyway. Uh, schism- schismogenesis uh, is uh, is the idea of defining yourself or your culture based upon what you are not, and usually you're basing that off of another culture that is in your sphere, right? So two cultures will say, um, "Well, I know what I am, but I also know what I'm not, and I'm not them," mm. right? So it. And it goes, it, it propels itself in polarizing directions because as there is uh, mounting disgust with the opposition, there's also mounting galvanization with the other population. So they can say, well, you know, those people on the right, man, they keep moving further right and I'm just going to make and move further left because I just want to show how not them I am. And this is, this is schismogenesis. So schism you know, meaning like a break between. So the Great Schism was the uh, was a, a point in religious history, and then Genesis to to be born, Schisma Genesis. Yeah, that that is a powerful term. It, it's what it comes all the way back to, though, is the idea that you see. Like, I took the leap, I guess, a little bit with it, where you see another person, like relating this to our culture now, where you were talking about earlier how people are constantly probing to try to see where you stand just based on one thing. Right, right. And you attack people without looking at their intention or their nuance. Yeah. And you keep calling them something. Like if you're on the right, you call them a a liberal wiener or whatever. If you're on the left, you call them a trumper or something like that. And you keep sticking your finger in their face over and over again. And eventually what happens? Psychologically, Mm -hmm. the law of physics starts to apply. Mm -hmm. Human beings give in and... Every action gets an equal but opposite reaction, and they become what you've been calling them. It's this self-fulfilling prophecy where then the person who's doing the calling gets to say they're right, but they made the world a worse place by making someone else the opposite of them because they're already bad, but now this person sucks too. This is this is a great term that you love too. Is uh, uh, is the Max Tegmark's term of Moloch, right? Mm. Oh, like, yeah, explain this. Yeah, yeah so yeah. Moloch, um, at least I, I think, I, I hope I'm not not butchering his his concept because I think it's a beautiful concept. Um, but the idea of um, Moloch is uh, when you follow naturally perverse incentives or you, you follow natural incentives and then you have this perverse outcome, right? Um, you can say, um, so, I don't know, uh, uh, a banker wants to uh, drive profits for whoever, um, and he wants to change regulations in order to uh, to do so. And those regulations might have uh, helped, you know, the little guy somehow. Well, potentially that leads to him making a worse city for him to, himself to live in. Mm. Nobody, like... He's followed his incentives, but those incentives are perverse in nature, right? Um, uh, let me give a better example of that. I think it's another good example of of uh, uh, of this this idea of Moloch, the the emergence of an anti human perverse incentive. Yes, right. This it's, is how. He, yeah, it's almost something that like hates humanity, but since everybody is following their natural incentives. It's this emergent property, right? So everybody wants their version of of peace and freedom. Um, but to do that, it is leading them to other or to create uh, a boogeyman on the other side of the political spectrum from them. And so in trying to create this better system, which everybody feels represented, everybody feels um, uh, equitable in, they're actually creating a system that's unlivable for everybody. Like, it's it, it's you it's it's an offshoot of a different idea. Like you, it's I make this word up, but it's like this offshoot of like utopitarianism. Yeah, right. So we've been fascinated in history with different powerful people, so so to speak, who have tried to like 
research into controlling minds and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And Love now, it. and now we're at this crossing point where people are starting to, the average person starting to understand this AI thing's real. And like, oh yeah. my god, what does this mean? What could it be? In reality, even if even if the algorithms that have been built aren't officially like the full blown AIs that we're now looking at bringing in, like you know the 2010 Facebook algorithm or something, they they st- first of all they still can be argued as the initial AIs, 100. percent And secondly, the AI to me that is the threat or the 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 sparking of the flame of the threat is actually the fact that the the road for it has been the internet. Mm-hmm. The road for these algorithms to drive their cars on is the internet. And what happens is people are brainwashed using the lowest common denomination of their flaws, right? So we've talked about them today. People want to be on teams. People want to therefore signal to their teams that I'm a part of you. People want to have an enemy, especially in peacetimes. Humans are wired to need an enemy, mm. they need a war. That's why maybe the military industrial complex thinks that way. We, mm. uh, Andy Bustamante has been on this show. I'll play it again right now and said, and literally said that we need an enemy. But like you created an enemy where we didn't need to have one. And so now you're saying that. So do you understand why people would judge that when they hear that? Yeah. So what I'm saying is not exactly what you're saying. What I'm okay. saying is we will the world when the world doesn't have an enemy it gets lost when human beings don't have something to rally against they start finding things to rally against so they just they subdivide and they subdivide again and they start they they argue about whatever they argue everything from buy local to you know you're a bad person if you hang this sign and you don't hang that sign or whatever it might be they they find reasons to subdivide the only way that we all ditch all these subdivisions is when we unify behind one large enemy. Well, I, I mean, look, this is this is exactly the Moloch that we're talking about. Like, yes, defense industry wants to make profit so that we're safe. Wars get made so that they can make profit so that we're safe. Maybe those wars make us unsafe. Well, that's great for business. But they already, they're changing the, they're changing people I think evolutionarily, mm. through, like the that's what I mean with the AI already here. The AI is already controlling people because the law of po- of large numbers and across populations, people are going to behave to a larger extent in this way or that way or this way or that way, and we've already adapted to that to the point that where you're already seeing it play out and simulated on on a grand scale. One of the first podcast we ever did in here was with my friend Alex Horowitz, who at the time was the chief of staff for Eight Sleep, which is like, you know, the best sleep product in the world, the earliest affiliate sponsor of the show, which was really cool. I've always wanted to sleep but on one of those. It it's it's a phenomenal Is it pretty product. good? I sleep on it every night. That rules. It's phenomenal and with all the little health problems I've had and stuff, like I can't imagine not having that over the past few years. I've slept in some fucked up beds oh, in my that's travels. That's what I'm saying. This is, this is a, this is a first world. Slept in some real messed up beds, man. This is a first world problem. So when you're back here in the first Ooh, world, yeah, I, I want gotta, you to enjoy a good I, eight sleep. I will, I will. But it would be funny if you took like the portable like eight sleep cover into like some war torn fucking country. Yeah. Like, hey, you guys have a cot I could put this on? Queen size? I, I, I feel like I feel like that would be something I wouldn't admit to in print. But but he when I had Horo in here, he's such a smart fucking guy. We we did a podcast that had some hot takes and some cold takes. Mm-hmm. You know, there there were certainly some cold ones in there, but some of the explanations he had from being inside the belly of the beast in in tech and understanding how this stuff works about how they can simulate behaviors ring in my ear all the time he's like they know like they being anyone who has access to stuff it's not like you know even this elite group it's just people who are in like tech and and build these tools they can process what people are going to do before they do it by using these tools to figure out how they respond to basic little behaviors yeah. to the point that we – and you know this should be kind of common sense now, but the way he explained it was so beautiful – to the point that they can figure out how things are going to go. You know, you've had intelligence over the years try to map things out and control them from behind the scenes, and sometimes that gets caught or whatever across the world. Now they, it's just as simple as they log in. 
Mm. And they can they can see what people are going to do because they know we are still these predictable animals. Even if there's little nuances to how we do things, we're still going to take certain actions based on certain impulses every time. And when they can control what those impulses are, whether that be as something as simple as trying to figure out how you're going to buy something yep. to you know how you're going to think about something, it gets scary out here. Well, this is I, – I think they call that um, – uh, uh, like a, a in silico analysis. Have you ever heard of that? I don't think so. No. In, in, in silico, silico. I think it's called in silico. Um, it's the it's the concept of um, uh, making a model of. Is it is it a thing? Yeah, I have it behind you. You yeah. can read it right oh, here. Sweet, right there. Yeah. So yeah, you're you're performing your your modeling behavior uh, in in large sets of yes. of human beings in in silico in silicon like um and. Uh, so you're you're creating you're giving this computer the notion of an individual and and seeing what behaviors that individual will take. Um, you know what's really crazy is have you seen the um, Nvidia um, uh, what is it like um, Nvidia demo where they have uh, like it's like a video game. The character comes into the bar and the bar and he starts talking to the bartender and the bartender doesn't have any scripted dialogue but like talks because they have an AI large language model that is like uh, and the large language model has been fed this character's backstory. So you can talk to the character about absolutely Sound anything, like but they'll always like talk about their own backstory and then learn more about you. And it like does it on the fly. Like what the fuck? Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah, point being, it's just getting it's getting scary. Out the here. tools are the tools. To, I mean, it goes back to generating consent, right? The tools to generate consent will become much more are becoming much more powerful. Um, and how how identities will will find one another um, and and merge with one another to mm. create other person groups will be very interesting. Good word there, merge. E, right? So, like, there's this this idea of, um, at least in um, The Sovereign Individual, this is a, a, a book that sort of formed a bit of the, the early Silicon Valley DNA, uh, and it predicts a death of the nation state uh, because the nation state will be unable, according to this author, be unable to fulfill the needs of what the nation state ideally does for right? people out there can you define exactly what you're referring to when you say nation state uh, uh so uh, a country as we would know them uh currently borders government central government i think the 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 general the the generally um uh like uh, granted in my book like i i try to figure out what a na what a country really is but i think the the geopolitical definition of it is a uh, uh, an area of land contained within borders which has a government right it's a fairly broad idea sure um but yeah that's what we mean by by nation states um and nation states have certain things that they usually provide to their their populace right um they oftentimes provide defense. They provide um, sometimes health care if you live in a different country than the United States, but they provide infrastructure. They provide rules for the road for doing commerce and, and, and um, uh, social uh, interactions. Uh, and then oftentimes as an emergent property or sometimes as a, a property that is uh, astroturfed onto the place, you, they provide a galvanizing story for the individuals. So... What happens when financial power and even the power of violence and even cultural power is dissolved away from that land, right? Think about how uh, businesses in the United States export labor out to, uh, you know, Malaysia or to China, wherever. Now, they're an American business, but maybe most of their employees or most of their outsourced labor is happening outside of our borders because mm -hmm. money doesn't care about borders. Right. And so now divide away money from a nation. Can you? Then divide away violent force away from a nation. If you, it, Here's a question. Maybe I'm fucked up, but I've said this on podcast, mm. and I hope I'm right. If a government doesn't have some level of of control over money they can't exist it becomes very difficult becomes very very difficult um 
And I think you'd I'd have to uh, to understand exactly what you mean by control over money, I right? I mean, I mean, uh, sorry, I'm just checking the production here. Make yeah, sure yeah. we're good. I mean that. Can I use it in an example just to make yeah, it easier? Of course, yeah, yeah. Governments aren't incentivized for something like Bitcoin to work. Ah, oh, this is perfect. Hold on, let's let's talk about this. Go, go with it. Okay, so um, let me let me gather this up uh, by uh, by taking you back to Iraq for a second. Oh, to Iraqi Kurdistan. Good, because I was going to bring it back there. Okay, fantastic. So, um, well, I was in Iraqi Kurdistan. I was, um, you know, I was hanging out in Erbil, and also just, um, you know, I'm on a, a damn shoestring budget. Um, I, yeah, I've got a couple hundred dollars, and I'm trying to r- live for a year in unrecognized nations, uh, <laughs> like you do. And uh, so I went to the like local hangout for for like the fancy journalists. And I decided I would go fishing for journalists so that I could maybe tag along with them, work with their fixers and translators and just, you know, learn. Their fixers? Yeah, yeah. Just uh, their, their fixers, their, like, uh, which is like a translator and a, a person who like uh, helps you get interviews, stuff like that. Because these rallies were coming up and I, I, you know, I didn't have a translator. I have no access. I'm a third grade teacher. So These are the ones that were the pictures on your on your oh, camera yes. yeah, that yeah, the yeah. guy this, was looking this at? This is from the, the Masood Barzani rally. Um, so anyway, I just went to this, uh, went to this uh, uh, hotel and, you know, was having a, having a, a, a coffee and just listening for somebody to speak English. Uh, and then I was like, well, I'm going to go make friends with them because I want their, their access uh, to these rallies. And so I was just sitting there, you know, with my earbuds in, but like not you know, actually listening to anything, waited till a couple of journalists spoke English and then, you know, insinuated myself into their conversation. And really nice guys. Uh, shout out to Royal and Marcel. Uh, they're Dutch. Um, so we chatted for a bit and I told him what my project was. And and Marcel was like, um, hey, you know, if you're if you're interested in, in countries that that aren't like fully recognized, you should check out Lieberland. And I was like, what's Lieberland? Mm-hmm. And he's like, well, it's it's the world's first libertarian micro state that's funded off of cryptocurrencies. <laughs> and it's on an empty island between Croatia and Serbia. And I was like, that doesn't that doesn't get me any closer to understanding what Lieberland <laughs> is, man. I don't what? And he's like, well, look, do you do you just want the contact information for the president of Lieberland? Because I have that. And I was like, yeah, of course I want. Yes. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> I want the president's phone number. Oh, my God. And so while I was uh, while I was on my stateless journey, I um, just kind of whenever I had free time and because it just was kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, I have the map behind. Yeah, I, I, I would just like message the president of Lieberland, like, <laughs> I, like I just slide in his his DMs and be like, hey, I'm I'm working on a book about you know this stuff, and you know I would be in Kurdistan this this whole time, so uh, might not see you. And he like never really responded to me, but then I started. I mean. One of my buddies, uh, he just thought it was so hilarious that I had this, and so I, I, he'd always ask me like, "Hey, have you have you messaged Lieberland again?" And you said it's an island. Yeah, it's an island in the Danube. On oh, in the river. Yeah, in the river. Yeah. Son of a bitch. Yeah, so yeah. like you can like see like the two shores uh-huh. very easily. Yeah, They're, like right there. Exactly. How big's this island? Seven square kilometers. About a, 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 it's about as big as uh, the Vatican. Well, that works. I mean, yeah, right. Um, so anyway, I was I was just bothering the president of Lieberland, and I, I finished up in Kosovo, and then I went to a place called Transnistria, um, which is uh, this place between Ukraine and Moldova. Really strange, little like unrecognized autonomous zone. Um, they consider themselves their own country, but they're only recognized by other unrecognized countries, um, and th- it's a strange place. Um, but anyway, I was, I was writing there, I was interviewing people there, and eventually I get an email back from Lieberland, and Lieberland's like, hey, uh, if you want to meet us, <laughs> you can come to our third year anniversary. I'm like, where is it? And they're like, it's in it's in Novi Sad, Serbia. Uh, and I was like, oh, okay. So in another country. Yeah. I'm like, so when do I have to get there? And they're like, you got to get there in three days. So I'm just like, I'm in eastern Moldova next to Ukraine. Um, like, what year is this? It is 2018. Okay. Um, and so, can I stop you? I have a question. Yeah, here. yeah. Are they? They're not recognized. We know that. But like, do they pay taxes? To well, Serbia? hold on. 
<laughs> so, because this is going to get weirder. Okay. Uh, so, I found out about the Liberlandians from, you know, just like going to going to meet them. And I didn't really even know what meeting them meant. There was very, there wasn't a ton of information. Marcel had made a documentary about them. Um, and I was just told through these like random cryptic messages, like, yeah, just go up to this, this harbor in Northern Serbia and you can maybe find us there on, on the boats. And so I just like, you know, uh, I'm following the instructions of some stranger who doesn't want to identify themselves for some reason. And uh, I get up to Apatine Harbor in Serbia and I'm like, well, I'm looking for a boat, so I guess it's on the water. So I walk towards the harbor and then I see the see the flag of Libra Land <laughs> just flying o- over this houseboat. And I go up and there's a guy on the boat, this shirtless dude who's on the boat and, and he's hanging out with, with presumably his girlfriend. And, and I was like, hey. And then he like looks over and he's like, are you a Libra Landian? And I was like, no. And he's like, well, let's change that and come <laughs> aboard. <laughs> like, okay. So I go up and I meet this guy and um, I'm like, what is happening here? And he's like, oh, well, we're cleaning up the boat for the third year anniversary because... Uh, we're gonna we're gonna go see the island, and I was like, "Oh, cool, dude!" Is like like this big old crypto anarchist guy. I'd never heard of Bitcoin at this. Where point. was he originally from? The Netherlands. Um, and he was like, "I realized one day that the euro was funded from death, and I <laughs> couldn't be a part of that system anymore." <laughs> And I was like, what? How does that work? <sighs> and then he's like, well, you know, he sort of runs me through the yeah. the, the general, like, crypto anarchist, you know, uh, uh, shaking your hand at the Federal Reserve thing. Um, I did a couple podcasts with my boy, Matt Kemenash, who, who's so smart, but he talks like that. Yeah, he's it, like, what's the, what is the U.S. dollar backed right, by? Yeah. The it's U.S. military. Dipped in blood. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but mind you, I was having this conversation with a, a shirtless Dutch guy. Shout out to Yoshi. Um <laughs> And uh, on the top of this houseboat with the Liberland flag flying in back of me, I'm like, what the fuck is happening? And so, uh, and he's like, yeah, well, I'm unbanked. Like, I got arrested by the Croatian police and they took me to Croatian jail. I could have gotten out at any time, um, but I wouldn't pay them in their money. I would only pay them in Bitcoin. And I was like, <laughs> you got to hand it to, the dude is like dedicated They're to dedicated. his thing. And he's right. like, well, okay, just go. And I'm like, look, I'm trying to meet the president. And he's like, cool, um, go to the conference, the cryptocurrency conference in Novi Sad tomorrow, and I'll see what I can do. And I'm like, okay, great, thanks, shirtless guy. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, real quick, like, how'd you, how'd you make uh, uh, all your Bitcoin? And he's like, oh, I was, a, I was a rent boy in the Netherlands. And I was like, what is that? And he's like, I suck dick for Bitcoin. And I was like... Oh, like in the red light district yeah, or some I, shit? I guess. Is that so even I, the right country? I'm it is. It's is in the, the Netherlands. But I was like... That? I, I was like, what year? And he's like, oh, like 2013. I was like, you must have a lot of Bitcoin. He's like, I do. And I'm like, cool. You're unzipping your pants. <laughs> cool. <laughs> cool, cool, man. <laughs> and then I like got on my bus, went back to Novi Sad. And then I was like, I guess I'll meet him at the, at the cryptocurrency conference the next day. So go to the cryptocurrency conference. And then I meet the secretary of state. Secretary of State is this, like, really genteel upper-class Englishman, and he's, like, working with the Queen of England, and and I'm like, what the, how are you, like... He's working with the Queen of England yeah, he's, he's like Secretary he's like, of State. Yes, 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 all of those things. How's that? I asked him that, and he's like, well, we all have different identities, don't we? And I was like, but what are we doing here? He's like, we're making a country. I'm like... What does the Queen think of this? I don't think he asked her. <laughs> I didn't. I, I should have asked that. There, there's a lot of questions that I should have asked along this entire journey that I Dude, just. I was like, you too, have a million things coming at you, yeah, and it's impossible I mean, it's to so ask true. all of them. So. Anyway, we talked for a long time, and, and honestly, he was, he was a brilliant dude uh, talking about self determination and about about like what Liberland is, the idea of creating this not only like you know a state that was created because it was this island was declared no man's land at the fall of Yugoslavia. So since it was declared no man's land, the president, Vigilika, he could come in and be like, yo, this is my country now. 
I got a flag. Now we got to like I've declared. Now I got to get recognition. And the idea more broadly is like creating this libertarian free ec- economic zone that exists in Europe, but is not necessarily a part of Europe. That's actually not that weird. Like. Liechtenstein is the statelet that, um, like, the Isle of Jersey has these these different um, uh, economic rules. Jersey, yeah, the Isle of Jersey in Jersey. Where the fuck is that? It's off of the coast of England. Um, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why you're New Jersey. We're not the only Jer- old Jersey. Son of a bitch. Old Jersey is this island. I yeah. thought it was, but I thought Old Jersey was actually in the fucking country. No, it's an island. It's an island. Yeah, it's an island. They got God, like that explains so much weird economic things that like yeah. I mean, there's even a place called the Isle of I think it's the Isle of Quiche, which is a free economic zone outside of Iran. What does that even mean? Free economic zone. It's kind of like a no pl- oil. Uh, <laughs> it, <laughs> I, I I'm sure there's an actual definition for it, but I think it's like a a place where you can do business in the gray area of international regulations oh, son of a bitch all right i'll put jersey the map of jersey in the corner it is an island yeah i, I know oh, wait a second is that that's not right that's by france yeah no it is it, but and they even speak a, a they speak a language that's like but part the english. english own this how yep. did that happen <laughs> fucking war this is like if you can imagine <laughs> like someone like no, nah, it's yeah. gonna be a bad visual I, put on it. But like, no, it, it's literally wrapped by France. Word, yeah. Where's Normandy? I don't know. <laughs> Regular countries aren't my thing. I don't know if you've <laughs> if you've gathered that, dude. <laughs> anyway, it's all right. Continue. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm just no, like, no. A little Jer- mind blown and right and now. you're but you're right though because the the language of Jersey is uh, actually has like like it's it's partially French and it's partially like Old English and shit. Yeah. I have a buddy from. What did it say? J. Lou Tway. Hello. I like, don't know. I got to call my buddy Owen. <laughs> He he would know because he's from there. Um, Weird man. So God, I, the world is so cool, dude. It's so dope. That's the thing. That's what I wanna I wanna share with people. <laughs> so that's why you you write travel books because it's it's cool. It's a bunch of weird people doing a bunch of weird shit. Um, and so these Lieberlanders, you know, uh, the the Secretary of State is like, well, are you gonna come on the boats tomorrow? Maybe you can meet the president there. And I was like, what what boats? And he's like, well, we're gonna go out and see the island. We actually can't step foot on the island because the Croatian police are like, we're in a legal battle with Croatia right now. But like, we're what all does gonna- that look like? It, it the the legal battle was over. Like Croatia was anti Liberland. Uh, Serbia was nominally supportive of Liberland. Who owned it before they went there? It was declared no man's land by the treaty that ended Yugoslavia. So this seven kilometer island is just no one. Well, so the, now, while well, these dudes pulled up and on said you, flag Liberland, depending on who you ask, and they didn't just oh, because people Liber- don't have jurisdiction. Yep. Oh, son of so a the bitch. crazy thing was, the president of Liberland ends up getting himself arrested by the Croatian police. The Cro or and the, the the not not when I was there, but previously. Um, and Croatia says, hey, you can't enter our country from another country. Legally speaking, though, that gave them a defensible claim to say, you just said it's another country. You just recognized us. And then by trying to stop people from going onto the island, they gave Liberland a de facto border force. So that's why the Liberland can wait, take... Wait, 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 back up. Yeah. What do you mean they gave them a de facto border force? Well, their their borders are protected. By who? The Croatian police that are trying to stop people from coming onto the Liberland Island. And but now, it's the Croatian police protecting it. Mm-hmm. And it's now not the Liberland police. Right. Now they have, I think they just, I think this just happened in Liberland. I try to keep abreast of the Liberland news. Um, uh, I, I think they have an official border crossing with Croatia. Granted, this was five years ago that I that I was there. This is 2008. Okay. Um, anyway, so they're like, yeah, we're going to go on the boats. Um, we're going to take all these crypto nerds, go down the Danube for a couple of hours, um, party on these, like, boats. And granted, they're not all yachts. They're, like, a bunch of different, like, boats all kind of cobbled together. So, like, some people were just, like, on dinghies and some people were on little houseboats. And I, I got on the biggest boat because I figured that's where the president was going to be. <laughs> Uh, naturally <laughs> and so i'm like great i i'm on the boat we're we're going down the danube uh everybody's just like partying and listening to like top 40 hits off of like some boom box and we're all drinking official Liberland land wine which is called tierra nullis now do they 
are the grapes like stepped on in Lieberland? I don't think so. <laughs> I have no idea where they came, came in a plastic. It's, it's fucking Josh, yeah. and they just stuck a label on it. Yeah, right. It, it. It, yeah. It, it came in a plastic bottle. Um, oh, Franzia, they're real yeah, cheap. I, Christ, <laughs> slap in the bag of Lieberland wine. <laughs> That's what I should have called that chapter. God damn it. <laughs> so. The, and it's it's just this wild scene because it's like all these crypto anarchists like partying on like a little flotilla of boats yeah. while the Croatian police are like tracking us as we go up the Danube River between Serbia and Croatia. And I'm just like, man, I'm so glad that I just bothered the president of Liberland for like six months because it got me on these boats, but I got to meet the president of Liberland. How many people did you say was on this boat? Probably about uh, on the boat that I was on, maybe about. 2015 but i think the entire conference had about 80 people at and it. how big's the boat again it's a houseboat it was like um mm, two stories you can probably find it look up the liberty boat the liberty boat yeah liberland? liberty boat liberland the liberty boat liberland if i can get it i will put it on i'm sure land. i'm sure you'll find it on the screen is that it? That's it. Son of a bitch. All right, we'll put this. We'll put this on the corner of the screen. If you look, up, I don't know if you if you can, but if you look up my Instagram, you'll see all this all this shit. Um, I don't know if I'm logged in on the computer. Yeah. What's the? Wait, is there a closer up? Is that it right there too? Or no, that's a different. That one, one I think is their new boat. I was on. I think I was on that one. God. I was on that one. That's yeah. funny. This is like a fucking pontoon boat with like two stories. No, I know, right? <laughs> So I'm uh, getting on the boat and I'm like just looking for the president of Liberland and I can't find him. And I'm like, I saw him go on. There's no way he could have gone anywhere else. It's a boat. It's, it's a boat. He can't leave. Just leave a boat because it's a boat. Right. And he's and then I'm looking over the, the railing and I'm, I'm just trying to figure out where the president is. And then I hear people cheering from him back and then I look over and president of Lieberland Vigilika is just tearing along the Danube on a damn jet ski fucking just cruising alongside the Croatian police between the cryptocurrency junkie boats this is so bizarre I know I know your life is a movie it is fucking weird man um and I was like I got I have to I have to find some way on this jet ski I gotta yeah. I gotta get it. this is this has to happen um because I agree with Danny. Seth Rogen has to play you. <laughs> God I totally damn it. See it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So the guy's cruising on the jet ski so on, in between the Croatian the police ski. and the boat. Um, and, um, and I'm like, I mean, basically, I'm just like abandoning all self-respect. And I'm just like hanging off the side of the boat, like waving my arms, being like, hey, it is, it's me, the guy from emails. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I, I I hear this dude. He's like, uh, "You want to get on the jet ski?" And I turn around. And he's like, "Oh, I'm I'm Tom." I'm like, "Cool. What do you do?" He's like, "I'm the foreign secretary." And I was like, "Nice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Any anybody could introduce me to, to like a horse could be like I'm I'm the the secretary of war." And I'm like, "Yep. Everything is everything. <laughs> I don't know what's happening." I'm on a cryptocurrency boat surrounded by Croatian police, and a president of a country is mowing around on a jet ski in the middle of the Danube. Real quick, no. just a question about the actual island. Do yeah. they have homes on this island? I'll get they there. They live in... Okay. I'll get there. Um, mm -hmm. So they did, but they were bulldozed by the Croatians uh, eventually, or originally. Now they're building again. Mm. They, were the actually, they weren't like tents? They were real homes? <sighs> I think Yoshi was living in a tent for a short period of time. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, so... Tom is like, uh, hey, you want to get on the boat? And I was like, yeah. And so, and he had heard about my project. I guess, you know, it, my my email assault had circulated amongst the brass. And um, uh, so he waves Vit down and Vit like comes along and he's like on the jet ski and he's super blase because uh, he's just, he's, that's just that's just him um so like i'm like i think this is a remarkable moment in my life but he's just like you know on a jet ski and the dan you'd be like okay yeah you can get on if you want and I like hand tom my keys and, and passport and stuff i'm like thanks tom <laughs> <laughs> he like lowers me down onto the jet ski behind the president and like we haven't been introduced to one another well, you're so introduced now the first way i meet the, <laughs> uh, a secretary or like a, a, a head of state is just by holding him 
and I don't have a, a life vest or anything on. Like this is this is an anarchist boat party. So I'm just like holding him like a spider monkey, and he's like, "Hold on!" And I'm like, "Okay, I will." And then he just blasts off, and we're just like going on the jet ski. Imagine if you fell off. Oh my god! I, I, at this point, I was ready to die for this this book. Um, and so I, I'm just dumbstruck because it's like Croatian police lights and Katy Perry songs and <laughs> and blockchain conversations and Tierra Nullis and Tom and Yoshi and all these like what the fuck is happening? Why I'm on the back of the jet ski holding uh, a head of state? And I'm like, I oh fuck, I'm missing out on my like only chance to ask him a question. And I have so many because it's like you've. I've just been through three different countries, all of which fought violent conflicts to draw a line on a map. And the way that Liberland is doing it is through a cryptocurrency conference and they have free T-shirts. Like, <laughs> what is happening? And so I like... How sort long of, are you on this with them? Briefly. I know that the ride is going to come to an end soon. So I have to, I have to, you know, uh, I have to make my move and, and ask him my question. So I like, I kind of choke up on him. You know, you like, start with the neck. I I, I, I like get my my head over little, little foreplay over on the his neck, shoulder. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the right move. Um, <laughs> and I was like, "Hey, I'm Eric," and he's like, "I know who you are. You're the email guy." <laughs> I was like, "Yes, yes, I am." <laughs> and and then he's like, "I was like, look, I I like, yeah, I can't remember the exact wording that I, I had the question, in, but it's like I, uh, you know, I've I've just been living in unrecognized countries for all this time, and people have to fight and die for them, and fight these bloody revolutions, and then even end on, you know, in this this sort of shadow realm of partial recognition, and it's heartbreaking, but it's also inspiring, and da da da. I'm like, what? It, was it worth it? Was it worth it to start your own country? And then he like mm. kind of stops the the jet ski in the middle of like the crypto nerds and the Croatian police, and he's just like, everybody should start their own country, and he just like fucking guns it, and then just hits a sick one eighty huge wall of water, and then he just deposits me back on the boat, and I was like, that's either the most brilliant thing that I've ever heard or it's just complete nonsense. Either way, I was like, I support Vit Jedlika for president. <laughs> and then I was like, my criteria for a potential leader is so low <laughs> that all you have to do for my vote is a jet ski ride. Not kill people, though, too. Uh, right, that too. Listen. But it's like, I'm a child. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the problem. <laughs> you just dangle the right thing in front of my eyes, and I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll vote for you. This sounds great. You seem neat. Um, And then shit got weirder, right? So I get off the... <laughs> get off the jet ski. <laughs> you know, kind of move myself up with the help of Tom. And and then Tom is like, um, so like, where's the where's the next stop on your on your stateless country tour? And I was like, I'm gonna go to Somaliland, um, uh, northern the, an autonomous area in northern Somalia. And he's like, cool, we have an embassy there. <laughs> <laughs> How many people are in Somaliland? Uh, a couple million. <laughs> I can't remember. All right, that's I that's can't that's a lot, but I can't remember off the off the top of my an, head. We have an embassy there. Oh yeah. my god! And I was like, "Cool." And he's like, "You want to stay at it?" I was like, "Yeah, Tom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I want to stay at the Lieberland Embassy." And yes, of course I do. You think I sent all these emails for nothing? And so I I go back. I'm hanging out uh, with my girlfriend in Bulgaria for a while, and I'm like, "Oh my god, you'll never guess what!" Like. I'm going to go stay with the Liberlanders in Somaliland, which is great because I was like, I have zero dollars at this point. I had $300 in the world. Like my boot money had long ran out. I am just going to northern Somalia and hoping that that is enough money to live for like six weeks. Right. And so I don't hear anything from Liberland at this point, And I'm freaking the fuck out because I have a ticket to go to Hargeisa. 
Hargeisa. Hargeisa is the capital of Somaliland. Oh, um, good to know. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 really interesting city. Um, uh, previously, or sometimes known as the Dresden of Africa, due to the bombing campaigns mm. um, uh, at the, during the the fall of Said Barre, Bar, Said Barre's uh, uh, regime. So I. I, you know, like I can't do anything else. Like I just start sending text messages and emailing and be like, Hey, um, it's me, Eric. <laughs> Remember me from the jet ski? <laughs> like, uh, what am I going? <laughs> ooh, I need to know how to get to the embassy. <laughs> Can you just tell me an address or whatever they use in? Cause like, I just got to make plans if I'm <laughs> going there in like two or three days. And then I, I get a call from the, the president. He's like, send me your number. And I was like, okay. And I get a call from him and and he's like, hey. And I'm like, hello, Mr. President, I guess. And he's like, yeah. So uh, we had a problem. And I was like, okay. Oh, that's not good. I know. And I'm like, what's the problem? And he's like, well, we lost our ambassador to, to Somaliland. And I was like, oh, fuck. Did so, he die? <laughs> yeah, well, I, so, again, this is questions I should have asked but never did. <laughs> And I was like, <laughs> I was thinking about myself. I was like, that means I can't stay at the embassy oh my God. if you don't have an ambassador. And then he's like, yeah, um, look, I, I can't talk long, but I don't know if this would mess up your book or whatever. But like, would you want to do that? <laughs> Are you, you're not even a citizen. Your guy you met on a jet ski and he wants you to go represent his. I mean, it's this little island country, but he wants you to go represent you in an official capacity in yeah. another faraway land that isn't even recognized. And again, sir, I say to you, are you in the CIA? If I was. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the most batshit, completely nonsensical operation for zero purpose. Listen, I've heard, I've heard some crazier ones. You never know. Crazier little than... crypto anarchy. I mean, look. Little, I, little embezzlito. I, you okay. never know. I mean, that is that is probably... We didn't we didn't make any money while I was in Somaliland, if I can put it that way. So, Listen, I, yeah. here's what we're going to do. Go ahead. You're going to stop right there uh -huh. for a second. This is this is going great. Yeah. We have way too much on the bone, and you live in fucking Albania, yeah. so I can't just bring you in here like next week or yeah. something. So we're going to stop. We're going to do another episode. Okay. I'm going to drive you up to New York tonight. I'm, send, I'm not sending you on a fucking bus back. Oh, no, no. I can, uh, take, I can take the train. No. Well, I'm, I'm taking you back. It's no problem. How far away is um, New York from here? I can do it if I'm driving 95 minutes or so. Are you sure? Like yeah, yeah. I got you. Okay. So we're, we're going to do this right. So we're going to do another episode. I think... I think I'll release it on YouTube. I'll figure this all out later. Maybe it'll be Patreon. I'll definitely put some content on Patreon ahead of time and some exclusive content there. But we got to talk all about Somaliland. Yep. We got to talk about the Balkans, which is fucking so fascinating. It's yeah. like the center of the yeah, earth yeah. in a lot of ways, the center of conflict. We got to talk about all your time in Kosovo, learning about the formation of the country and the genocide that occurred there. And it wasn't just in Kosovo. There were other genocides, yeah, Bosnia yeah. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We got to talk about European nationalism. There's a lot on the bones. So this is going to be the end of this episode. Okay. And we will see you guys for the next episode we'll be right back you and me i guess sick all right guys we did end up talking about all that stuff i just mentioned there and more this next episode is absolutely loaded so hit that subscribe button hit that bell button so you find out when it's coming out and i'm going to be putting it out two days after i release this episode so if it's more than two days on the date stamp right there the link is already in the description below let's get it that said give it a thought get back to me peace